Testing one, two, three, four. Testing, testing. Okay, thank you. Good morning. In accordance with sections 45 and 53 of the Planning Act 1990 as amended, this meeting of the Committee of Adjustment of the City of Toronto is called to order. My name is Larry Clay and I'll be chairing today's session. Panel members today are Dylan Reed, Nellie Volpert, and Doug Wilkins, and our Deputy Secretary Treasurer is Sabrina Salatino. We acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Committee of Adjustment Public Hearings are now conducted in a hybrid in-person and virtual format. Some applicants and participants will make their submissions in person and others will participate virtually by electronic means through WebEx. The meetings are also streamed on the City of Toronto YouTube channel and anyone wishing to view the hearing may watch on YouTube. Those who want to participate virtually have and have registered in advance will be connecting with their computer, tablet, smartphone or telephone and have the option of participating via video or audio only. All virtual participants will automatically be muted upon entry. When your item is called, you will be unmuted by the moderator one person at a time. We ask that you also mute your devices until you are called on to speak. Those participating by video appearance will temporarily be upgraded to panelists when your item is being held. During this time, your, panel, your camera will be enabled. You will only be visible during your five minute allotted speaking time. At other times, your video will be disabled and you will be reinstated as an attendee. For both in-person and virtual participants, Committee of Adjustment staff will share presentations submitted in accordance to the written submission deadline. Those participating through WebEx are not allowed to use share screen or any other panelist controls during a video appearance. People attending in person today who want to receive a copy of the decision of the committee on an application must fill out a decision request card and those participating virtually need to submit a written request for a decision by email. Please ensure that you include your name, address and email address because the Committee of Adjustment and the Toronto Local Appeal Body will be sending notifications and appeal updates by email. If you do not agree with the decision of the committee, you may be able to appeal the decision to the Toronto Local Appeal Body or in some limited circumstances, the Ontario Land Tribunal. However, the provincial government amended the Planning Act and generally removed rights of third parties to appeal Committee of Adjustment decisions. Only the applicant, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, specified persons and public bodies are permitted to appeal decisions of the Committee of Adjustment. Appeal instructions are set out in the bottom of the decision of the committee. Today I'll call each item in the order listed on the agenda. Where an application is uncontested, the agent or applicant may proceed with their presentation if desired. When the committee does not require a presentation, applicants are to advise the chair should they wish to speak to the committee. The committee may ask questions and or take the matter into committee for a decision. 
Each speaker, including the applicant or the agent, will be given a maximum five minutes to address the committee, and I will comment when you are reaching the five-minute mark. Any presentation or other materials you wish to have uh, wish to submit to the committee must have been emailed in advance of the hearing. Staff and committee members cannot accept materials at the hearing. When addressing the committee, please clearly state your name and address, and please remember to confine your remarks to the matters outlined in the application. The applicant will proceed first and make a presentation to the committee on the application. Please note that the committee may not entertain revisions to proposals at the hearing today. The committee may decide to defer the application if substantially revised to ensure that the revised application is accurate and that all those entitled to notice of the application are informed of the changes. Then individuals either in support or opposed to the application will be invited to speak. Generally, we call first on speakers in the hearing room and then those participating through WebEx. Committee members may ask questions of each speaker after they have finished their presentation. When all speakers have, are finished, the applicant has an opportunity to rebut only those issues that were raised by the speakers. This will mark the end of discussion and the application will be taken into committee for decision. Madam Secretary, Deputy Secretary Treasurer, is there any minutes from previous meetings? Good morning, Mr. Chair and panel members. Uh, no minutes for adoption for today. Okay, any declarations of interest, panel or staff for the morning session? Seeing none. Is that the morning session or afternoon? No, that's the afternoon session. That's the afternoon session, thank you. Uh, uh, are there any deferral requests? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes. We do have two deferral requests from the agents. Item number 162, Russell Hill Road, and item number 11, um, 1099 Bay Street. Thank you. Can we deal with both right off? Do you sure. Think? Okay. And just, uh, there are no files to be closed thank you. at today's hearing. Okay, can we uh, start with item one, which is a request for a deferral? I'm going to read the application into the record. This is uh, uh, an application from for 62 Russell Hill Road. Uh, this is an application to legalize and maintain the rear third story balcony, which was constructed beyond the limits of the authorized building permit. The committee has before it a copy of plan survey, site plan, floor plans and elevations, 11 photographs of the subject property, cover letter from the applicant, uh, a deferral request from the applicant, and uh, an order to comply. We have re staff reports from uh, TRCA and uh, Ravine and Natural Feature Protection. There's correspondence and support from 64 Russell Hill Road and correspondence and opposition from 58 and 60 Russell Hill Road. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we just have the agent online, no registered speakers for this item. At this time, we'll unmute Marco Vieira. Good morning, Mr. Vieira. Members of the committee. Good morning. We have so, your name and address, please, sir. Sure. For the record, my name is Marco Vieira. I'm at 257 Dunraven Drive. I'm the agent for this application. Great. Thanks very much. We understand you're requesting a deferral. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, we are. We did have a chance to speak with TRCA. There's an ongoing violation for some landscaping work that was done in the rear yard. Um, and TRCA has asked me to deal with that matter, even though we feel that it's completely separate. Uh, but it does have a violation, and we will require the support of TRCA in order to pull a building permit. So we thought it was best to try to deal uh, with that matter at this time and then come back to you. Um, hopefully with just a matter of the balcony or if there's any other changes that we need to make uh, through the review process with TRCA, we will do so. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, panel, any questions? Okay. We'll go into committee. Um, can I get a motion to defer? I move the motion to defer. Makes great. sense. Mr. Wilkins, move motion to defer. Seconder. Uh, Ms. Volpert, all in favor? Your application is deferred, sir. Thank you very much. And we go on to, is the, uh, is the agent for item 11 here? Okay. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, 
My name is Tia Zanjani, and I'm the architect and the agent for this application. And my address is 15 Hot State Parkway, Markham. Great. Thank you very much. You're asking for a deferral? Uh, that's correct. Yeah. So we've, we've received comments from, from transportation, and, and they're requesting uh, a parking assessment study to be uh, conducted, uh, which, which takes a bit of time. So we, we like to defer this application so we can... Uh, can address that and then hopefully come back to you guys soon okay thank you very much panel any questions seeing none we'll take it into committee can i get a motion to uh mr reed i think it's a great idea to sort these things out so i move it to defer great motion to defer uh seconded by mr wilkins all in favor you have your deferral sir thank you very much okay we proceed then to uh item number two which is uh, 557 St. Clair Ave West. And this is an application to permit two hotel suites, each uh, with two bedrooms for a total of four bedrooms on the second story of the existing two-story mixed-use building. The proposed hotel does not meet the definition of a hotel under the Accommodation Sector Registration of Guests Act 2021. The existing commercial uses, uses in the basement and ground floors will be maintained and unaltered. The committee has before it a copy plan of survey, site plan, floor plans and elevations, one photograph of trees on the property, covering letter from the agent and uh, zoning bylaw uh, pertaining to this item. There is correspondence of concern from 48 Ellsworth Avenue. Through you, Mr. Chair, we just have the agent online, no registered speakers for this item. At this time, we'll unmute the agent. Thanks very much. Good morning, sir. Morning. You have your name and address, please. Yes, it's Rival Ukivi, and I'm at 40 Temperance Street, Toronto, Ontario, at Suite 3200. Uh, panel, I think we probably might have just a short presentation on this one. It, uh, it is an interesting application. If you could give us a short presentation, sir. Sure, happy to. And thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of committee. This is a fairly straightforward application, which is to adjust the old city zoning bylaw that currently is applicable to the current site at 557 St. Clair West to meet with the current definition of the hotel under the zoning bylaw 569-2013. This property has been 100% used commercially for at least the last approximately 20 years, which is the only history I can provide to this committee. Um, the old bylaw, which is 538-86, continues to apply to this site as this area developed shortly before 569-2013 was passed by the city, and it resulted in one of those many holes in the donut, so to speak, that exists throughout the city where that had occurred, where people didn't want the new zoning bylaw affecting the zoning that they had recently got into place on sites. On this site, the only variance required is uh, to add the definition of hotel from the bylaw 569 2013 to the site, which provides what, what I'll suggest is an even playing field between this property and other boutique hotels across the city of Toronto. The property has already two times commercial coverage, has the right to operate a hotel on site, but su is subject to an old definition of hotel tied to historic hotel operations that really are no longer the norm for so many whole hotels in that they don't provide food services on site. So the only comment received with this site was with respect to parking on Ellsworth Avenue. I just wanted to note, if you if you just stop scrolling there, you can see the, uh, uh, this, the, the, the Ellsworth uh, it has no direct connection as the, the, uh, as the property at 557 backs onto prop the backyards of properties on Ellsworth. Ellsworth is also a permit parking street, so the time that when parking would most likely occur in the evenings when people were staying is not permitted, and the distance to walk around to the property at 557 is quite, quite significant and is uh, farther than or equal to local parking garages that exist in the immediate vicinity. So the application is, I suggest, consistent with the official plan and zoning bylaw, and in fact brings it into conformity with the current zoning bylaw. It's minor in nature for the same reason and therefore desirable for the community. Those are my submissions subject to any questions from committee. Great, thank you very much. Panel, any questions? Mr. Reed? Yeah, just to clarify, so the, the bylaw that you're trying to kind of 
go under is the one that just says a hotel means premises used to cater to the needs of the traveling public by providing sleeping accommodations in rooms and suite or suites. So the the new bylaw doesn't have the restriction on the number of rooms. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, any more questions? Seems fairly straightforward. Uh, let's go into committee. Your thoughts, Dylan? Um, I, I was a little. Uh, I was still wasn't super excited about converting apartments to hotel rooms, um, but I, I see the point that this is a bit of just an anom anomaly. Um, and if most of the, this would normally be zoned with a sort of gen more general definition, I think it's reasonable. Okay. Uh, do you want to make a motion? Uh, so I'll move to accept, uh, so to approve these, um, to approve these variants. Great, variance. thank you so much. There are no conditions. I have a seconder. Ms. Bolford, thank you very much. All in favor? You have your approval, sir. Thank you very much. We move on to item number three, 475 Ossington Avenue. This is an application to alter the existing two and a half story detached dwelling by constructing a rear second story addition and a rear third story rooftop deck. There'll be three residential units within this dwelling. Panel has before it a copy of survey, site plan, floor plans and elevations, five photographs of trees on the subject property, a cover letter from the agent and previous decisions, committee decisions from surrounding properties. Through you, Mr. Chair, we don't have any registered speakers for this item. At this time, we'll unmute the agent. Great, thanks very much. Good morning. Hey, morning. <clears throat> Could we have your name and address, please? Uh, my name is Ying Yili. Uh, I just bought this 475 Washington Avenue, Toronto, M6G3T3. Okay, just hang on a second. Panel, uh, do you need a presentation on this one? I don't think we need a presentation, sir. I think we, we've read all the material. We understand the application. Before we take it into committee, is there anything you'd like to share with us? Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's the, yeah, because uh, some similar... Uh, uh, variance has been approved uh, by CO, uh, COA uh, in the neighborhood, so I think that's very um, like uh, minor variance. So I wish uh, the community of adjustment will approve my application. Okay, thanks very much. Panel, any questions? Seeing none, we'll take this into committee. Comments, thoughts? Mr. Wilkins? Um, no, I don't have too much to say. I think um, when you look at the existing FSI, it's a really marginal increase. So I think this is minor and I would move to approve. Okay. We have a motion to approve by Mr. Wilkins. Do I have a seconder? Mr. Reed, all in favor? You have your approval, sir. Thank you very much. We move on to item number four which is uh, 216 to 222 Geary Avenue. This is an application to permit an outdoor patio and open storage area on the existing vacant lot, which will be in, in conjunction with the existing ground floor and mezzanine eating establishment at 218 Geary Avenue. Also to permit a front yard outdoor patio in conjunction with the existing ground floor and mezzanine eating establishment at 218 Geary, and to convert the ground floor and mezzanine of the existing building, uh, 222, 222, 220 and 222 Geary Avenue into two eating establishments, each with a front yard, yard outdoor patio and also to remove the existing parking spaces. Panel has before to copy the plan of survey, site plan, floor plans, revised site plan received March 20th, two photographs of the subject property, Decision number A296 06 EK, EYK affecting the subject property, email correspondence from the agent. We have staff reports from transportation services and community planning. We have the correspondence and support from 8 Bristol Avenue and correspondence and concern from 310 Bartlett, 189-199 Geary Avenue, um, 215 Geary Avenue, one from um, uh, Ms. or Mr. and Ms. Medina with no address provided, and correspondence and opposition from also from 14 Bristol, 10 Bristol, and 12 Bristol. Through you, Mr. Chair, we don't have any registered speakers for this item. At this time, we'll unmute the agent. 
Good morning. Good morning. Um, Edward Lee here at 6 Argyle Street uh, on behalf of the owner. Great. This is a, a, a somewhat uh, complicated application. I wonder if you could give us a presentation, please. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I just want to start by mentioning that the owner of these four lots, which are on title as one uh, combined lot, um, has been a big proponent of all the arts and music and hospitality stuff going on in Geary um, and was, has been involved even in the implementation of the um, Geary zoning bylaw amendments that uh, loosen the, the regulations on, res on restaurant use um, on Geary. Um, so he approached me with this proposal to uh, convert the remaining buildings uh, at 220 and 222 into um, eating establishments. Uh, 218 is a, an existing um, eating establishment, and the vacant lot at 216 uh, is part of this application to be proposed uh, as a patio associated with 218. Um, so before we even went down the path of applying for minor variants, um, I proactively reached out to city planning uh, about our proposal and to get their um, essentially blessing on moving forward with this application. Um, preliminary feedback was that the use of restaurants is in line with the, the citywide uh, bylaw, um, you know, essentially wanting to uh, accept that there is changing uses in this uh, otherwise employment industrial zone. Um, under the old uh, city bylaw, restaurant use is still not permitted. Um, so obviously we, we knew that committee of adjustment would be required for this. Um, in addition to this, um, because Geary is kind of moving in that direction of becoming a hospitality and art destination in the city, uh, the use of these front driveway areas uh, for patios is something that I previously had approved uh, at other locations on Geary. Uh, I felt that this was appropriate uh, for the street and uh, city planning uh, also believes that it's an appropriate uh, use. Um, so really the discussion around this application was primarily um, about the 216, the vacant lot use. Um, and I went into discussions with city planning with an open mind to see you know, what they thought was appropriate. And essentially the, um, the revised site plan drawing that was included in your package is the final site plan after negotiating with planning staff on um, on the setback for the fence at 216 the proposed landscape buffer with cedar hedges along the rear property line um, we also knew that obviously we would need support from the immediate neighbor to the north um, at number eight bristol avenue so we reached out to those owners uh, very early in the process to make sure that they were supportive of our application and obviously them learning that city planning has uh, requested a landscape buffer with cedar hedges for visual privacy um, and the eight meter setback for the 1.8 meter fence um, all of these uh, we accept obviously to um, satisfy planning's concerns and as well as being respectful to the neighbors at number eight bristol um, the letters that have come in with concerns from the other neighbors um, further north I, I believe at 10 and 12 bristol avenue um, obviously, you know, we were sensitive about this application. That's why we reached out to the planning staff proactively early on. Um, in, in my view, because the patios are all Geary facing onto Geary, and we've dealt with the rear yard condition neighboring onto 8 Bristol, um, that patio is fully enclosed now between the buildings on Geary and the building at 8 Bristol. Um, so I, I, I don't have concerns that sound emanating from this patio would transfer up further <clears throat> down Bristol, uh, but obviously here are their concerns and, and respect that they've submitted letters of concerns about this. Um, and the other um, item that was discussed uh, with transportation services um, in light of their um, planning report is the condition at the front. Um, obviously proposing patios to occupy the private uh, front yards of all of these buildings um, no longer allows for parking at the front. Um, so planning staff have uh, recommended that the curb cuts for all of these uh, units be 
uh, eliminated and the curb be reinstated. This came in kind of at the last minute, so I've had to talk to the owner about this. Um, a costly endeavor to obviously, um, you know, pay the city to do this road work to reinstate the curb. Um, the thing, the one concern that the owner has is that in the future, if he has a tenant that does not need a patio, does not need to operate a meeting establishment, um, that the loss of the curb cut and the loss of parking in front of the building um, would be lost. Um, so I was speaking to transportation services about the possibility of having them accept that when we do apply for building permits, um, that only the units where a front patio is actually proposed as part of the permit application, would the uh, reinstating of the curb be required for those units. Um, so it gives us time, gives me time to work with the owner to see what tenants um, you know, might actually want to go forward with the patio, obviously not knowing what the cost from the city to reinstate the curb will be. That's a cost that obviously the incoming tenant would like to know. So, um, so in, in summary, uh, we accept the planning and transportation conditions uh, recommended. Um, and having been very proactive about this whole process leading up to this hearing, um, I, I feel confident that this is appropriate for development of Geary and um, uh, open to any questions or concerns that Great. committee members have. Thanks very much. Um, and that's helpful to get the clarification on the transportation condition, but we will, as you say, if we decide to approve this, we'll keep that in. Um, can we speak a little bit about the the noise? A lot of the neighbors were raising concerns about noise, not not generally, but more specifically deep into the evening. Have you yes. any plans for, uh, for example, are you planning to have amplified music past 11 o'clock at night? Well, um, I'll be honest that I, I expected that maybe planning staff might uh, stick that condition, especially for 216, because that's the only patio that um, is set back from the residential zone. Um, I've done many, you know, rear patios on on laneways, um, and at 11 o'clock, uh, kind of curfew on amplified music has always been a condition. Um, I believe that planning staff viewed all four of these as being geary geary fronting patios, uh, as opposed to being technically a rear patio. Um, so I, I mean, I don't believe that a curfew on on operating hours and music should apply to 218, 220, and 222 since they're exclusively front yard patios that face onto Geary with no real chance of sound kind of, you know, affecting the neighbors um, at the rear of the lot. Um, but the owner is, is, is open to, I mean, obviously just being a good neighbor, um, they would not, they've told me that they would not have any amplified music past the noise bylaw 11 o'clock uh, curfew on, on amplified sound. So I'm not sure if that's something that committee wants to put into the decision. Um, we're, we're open to that, I guess. Okay. For so we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, thank you. So your, yep. your view is that the front gear facing patios, uh, don't, pro don't represent a, a noise issue, uh, but the 216 patio would, and you're open to having a condition on hours of operation, or at least hours of uh, using outdoor music. Yes, um, in the past, I've, I've accepted a, a restriction on amplified music after a certain hour. Um, but these technically being Geary fronting patios, um, I think for consistency, I, I don't think limiting operating hours is. Uh, no, no, and I, I don't think we're proposing yes. to do operating hours. It's just the noise, yes. I think. Okay. Well, at least that's yep. one consideration. Yep. Okay, panel, any uh, questions? Further questions? The chair, oh, I have a quick question for you, sir. Um, do you have anything you'd like to say about the, some of the neighbors' concerns about the parking? Yes, um, I, I've been to committee for other um, restaurant patio applications on Geary. Um, so these, some of the neighbors that have written in on this one actually did write in on previous applications as well. Um, even when I go up to the site, it's true. There's a, a lack of street parking, um, in the area. Um, 
some of the concerns, I guess, from the neighbors is that having additional eating establishments on Erie is going to bring more traffic to the area, further making the parking uh, issue more challenging. Um, I, you know, planning staff and transportation staff, you know, are aware that, um, you know, that if there's a lack of parking, people are going to have to depend on public transit and cycling and, you know, walking to the restaurants. Um, so there's nothing, you know, really that we could do on our property to help with the parking situation. Obviously, having patios on these on these front yards would prevent illegal parking. That's something that um, all of the owners on Geary complain about. People just park wherever they can. Um, so, so that I, yeah, I guess uh, transportation services obviously considered this. Um, um, for my previous applications four or five years ago, uh, transportation services, um, you know, commented that parking was an issue. Um, they didn't actually comment on it this time around. Um, so I'm guessing that maybe, you know, they accept that uh, these are the limitations of parking in this neighborhood and that, uh, you know, patrons of these future restaurants will have to depend on public transit to get around. So Geary is a very unique in, uh, street in, quite dramatic transition right now. Uh, we're seeing much more activity, which is going to generate traffic, which is good. Uh, are there any public parking areas in the vicinity? Um, I'm not aware of this. Um, I, I would think that maybe a larger lot that or a, develop, a condo development that could accommodate uh, public parking um, would be more appropriate, I guess, to maybe push for some additional parking spaces. Um. So uh, we, we, I mean, not necessarily specific to your application, but more, more broadly, I think yes. parking and transportation is an issue in this area that I think someone's gonna have to address at some point. Nellie, did you have a question? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first, uh, what type of restaurant is going to be there? Do you, do you know? I mean, with, without getting into the qualitative aspects, um, the restaurant, the tenants that the owner has been speaking to are all fine dining, you know, trying to bring in some, some of the best chefs in, to, to our city. So these are all gonna be, you know, proper eating establishments. Okay, so it's not a bar or anything like that? Well, I mean, that's one of the things I'm, I'm faced with all the time is this question of when is it a bar, when is it a restaurant? Every restaurant technically is a bar. Um, I'm always a proponent of of bars having uh, a food program that is, you know, equivalent or, or, or not larger than the bar component. But the one thing that will, you know, that restricts eating establishments masquerading as nightclubs is the size of the establishment. And these are not, these individual units are not, you know, going to fit 100 people inside. So, you know, at the end of the day, when I apply for building permits, the seat count is always dictated by the size of the establishment. So, um, you know, if any, if your question is really to address any concerns about these operating as pseudo nightclub bars, um, I can reassure you they they will be eating establishments. Okay, and are there any restaurants in the vicinity? Still, I understand that's, uh, you know, the restaurant is not a permitted use, but you you have one restaurant on yes. site already. Well, so, well, there's one at 218. Um, across the street at 217 is is a very well-known restaurant uh, that uh, was my application um, we didn't go to the committee of adjustment for that one because it was an existing eating establishment um, and there's actually been many you know i would say high profile restaurants that have made news about geary and um, i think this is what actually pushed former councillor anna bailau to um, to set the wheels in motion to uh, to loosen the, the, the citywide bylaw to permit restaurants and breweries, um, those types of uses, which were previously also not permitted under the, the citywide, uh, sorry, citywide bylaw. So um, the fact that the the former Toronto bylaw still applies is, I, I believe, a technicality because the, the new citywide bylaw uh, does permit restaurant use. Um, I mean, it's it's a it's a bigger question that I've always had about zoning. At that, you know, what to do in these situations where former bylaw 
prohibits the use, whereas the new new bylaw allows them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any further questions? Okay. Uh, let's take this into committee. Anyone have any thoughts, comments? Uh, I'll start. And uh, it's. Uh, I think this is a, a really interesting and unique area. It. Uh, if you've ever been on Geary, it's uh, a fascinating example of a street and an area that's going through a, quite a rapid uh, transition from former industrial because of the proximity of the rail line and uh, into commercial and, and retail and, and restaurant activities. And it's, I think, something that is good for the area. And uh, so I'm, I'm generally in support of this application. My only concern is the noise on uh, the 216 uh, parcel particularly. So um, my view would be uh, as a suggestion to, uh, to put a stipulation that no amplified music occur after 11 o'clock at night on that property. Yes, Dylan. Um, yeah, I agree. My, my main concern was um, the separation of the storage area and the uh, residential and the planning condition takes care of that. So I was pleased to see that. Um, yeah, I mean, this is an area where there has been a lot of restaurants and other interesting destinations opening up. Uh, so this seems to fit well within the within the space and it's certainly an improvement in terms of the, the street frontage from what's there currently. Um, I totally agree with uh, having the condition about no amplified music after 11 on 216. I think that's important to add. Great. Do you want to make a motion to that effect? I just wanted to put in that I suppose I have a little bit more concern also about the parking because just in terms of the general intent and purpose of the official plan, I think for employment areas that um, you know small scale restaurants are permitted and but there's also a concern in the official plan about mitigating potential negative impacts from traffic generated by development uh, within employment areas and adjacent areas and I I think when you look at three restaurants together, I, I mean, I'm not sure even a small restaurant, if you have three going at once, could be 100 people on that small street. And so I do think some of the concerns that neighbors are raising or even the neighboring businesses about how people are going to get there uh, or, or you know, how they're going to deal with the increased traffic. And because it's a business area, I think it, it's not just the same as in a residential area where, you know, there, there may be street. I, we often, I mean, I often don't seem to mind when a neighborhood is dense, getting more dense, and it's going to create a bit of pressure on the parking. But this might create a lot of pressure on the parking, not just for residents, but also the businesses. So, I mean, that, that's my big concern. And I, and, but I see what the agent is saying. I don't see how they can mitigate it with this particular lot. So I don't know, that that's just my concern. Yep, that's helpful, thank you. Nelly, any thoughts? I just, my concern was about the storage again and the noise and I think it's been addressed. With, uh, with regards to <clears throat> parking, obviously you, you, like, if you have a restaurant you cannot have parking like, <laughs> in front of it, so it's just, in, you know, patio is the most logical use and um, um, uh, it's a problem, but I, I don't see how it's going to be mitigated here, like, un unless we, there is some alternative solution, but I don't see it. Thank you. I'll make a motion then. Um, okay, so I move we approve these variances with the transportation condition, the planning condition, and a condition that there's no amplified music after 11 a.m. on the uh, 216 site. Thank you very much. We have a motion uh, to approve with those conditions, a seconder. Nelly, all in favor? Okay, Doug, you're opposed? Okay, so um, uh, that is approved. Uh, Sabrina, could we put a, I think we're all concerned about the traffic issue and the parking issue. Could we put a for the record item, just noting that committee raised concerns about the overall parking for Geary, uh, in, in, you know, and need you know should be addressed in some fashion. Is that? Can we do that? Through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, you can. We we can put it as part of the minutes yeah. and note it as for the record. I, I think it's important. I mean, we're not going to tell anyone what to do, but I think it's a 
it's an emerging issue that is going to have to be addressed as we see more of these types of applications on this stretch. Mm -hmm. Sure. So Thank you. It'll be for the record. Uh, members have raised concerns regarding overall parking and noise on Gary. Yep. Great. Thank you. Is that okay with you guys? Okay. Well, especially because it's actually not super close to transit. Uh, I've been there, so it's a bit of a hike down to the subways. Yeah, it, uh, I've been there too, and yes, it, yes, it is. You're hoping for bike and walking traffic, but it's going to be most people are going to be Ubering or driving. Yeah. Thank you. You have your approval, sir. Thanks very much. Okay, we move on to item number five, which is 980 Bloor Street West. And the, this is an application to alter the development standards for a mixed use uh, building uh, previously approved on a zoning, a site specific zoning bylaw by increasing the overall building height, density, and number of stories from 11 to 13. Also to reduce the development standards for the required amenity space for, uh, from 468 square meters to 453 square meters to reduce the number of uh, required number of resident parking spaces from 52 to 42 and to alter the requirement the required dimensions of bicycle spaces committee has before a copy of the draft plan of survey copy of plan of survey site plan floor plans and elevations revised zoning waiver received on february 29 2024 two photographs of the subject property covering letter from the agent an arborist report a functioning service and stormwater management report, an energy report, a shadow study, transportation impact study, wind study, and presentation materials from the agent, a revised diagram number seven received February 27th. We do have opposition in cor correspondence and opposition from 14, whoops, I apologize. <laughs> Sorry, wrong piece of paper. Uh, we have uh, staff reports from transportation services and community planning and a staff report from uh, the TTC and we have correspondence and support from 772 Dover Court Road. Through you, Mr. Chair, we do have the agent here in person today. We also have two registered speakers online. I do want to turn uh, the committee's attention to two reports that we, we received yesterday. So the first one is the transportation uh, staff report. Um, and you haven't had a chance to review this, so I would ask the agent to refer to this report as part of their presentation, just to outline the conversations that they've had with transportation services. The second letter is from the ward councillor. Uh, again, uh, you haven't had a chance to review this, but there are no objections uh, and uh, the councillor is just reiterating the conditions that are imposed from community planning. That's great. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Okay, sir. Uh, welcome. We have your uh, name and address, please. Thank you, sir. Good morning. My name is Max Laskin. Um, partner at Goodman's LLP. Our address is 333 Bay Street in Toronto and I'm counsel to the applicant. Great, thanks very much. I think we'll need a presentation. You've got five minutes, and if you could address what the Deputy, uh, Deputy Secretary Treasurer noted, that would be helpful as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. This application seeks to modify an existing permission for an 11-story mid-rise building at the northwest corner of Bloor and, Do and Dover Court to facilitate two additional stories. This will allow for 18 additional homes in a project that is already under construction within a mixed-use area on a designated avenue and within two major transit station areas making an immediate impact on housing supply exactly where policy directs such housing to go. Before I go further, Mr. Chair, I want to make two important points at the outset. The first is that planning staff have written a report recommending approval. They haven't simply indicated no objections. They've advised that in their opinion the four tests are met and are therefore recommending approval. They're also recommending a $100,000 contribution towards affordable housing, which our client supports. The second is that the local councillor has provided a letter indicating no objections as well as uh, Ms. Seltzingham indicated already. As you can see on the first slide, um, which simply shows the context, the site is located directly on Bloor Street, about 230 metres from Ossington Station and 500 metres from Dufferin Station. The site also has the benefit of being located on the Bloor Street bike lane and convenient access to TTC bus service as well, including on Dover Court. Under the official plan, which is shown two slides forward, the site is located on an avenue where mid-rise intensification is promoted, as you know, and it's also designated mixed-use areas, the designation in which the official plan directs the most significant concentration of growth. The site is also somewhat unique in the avenues context, Mr. Chair, in that there are no immediately adjacent neighborhoods. 
the, the lands immediately to the north are also designated mixed use. And in my submission, that makes this site particularly well suited to accommodating uh, some additional density. Against the backdrop of this policy framework, the, uh, in 2020, the Ontario Land Tribunal approved an 11-story building, which was shown on the screen a moment ago. I want to pause on a key point here, Mr. Chair. The only parties involved in that 2020 approval were the city and our client. There was no community opposition to that original application and therefore no other parties to that tribunal appeal or the settlement. As a result, Mr. Chair, this means that the only two parties involved in the previous approval are also here before you today recommending approval of this minor change. This distinguishes this application from some of the other applications that have come before this committee. Uh, moving to the next slide, you can see the requested variances summarized briefly, which fall into four general categories. The first is height and density, which is where I will spend most of my time. The second is amenity space. The applicant has actually increased the total amount of amenity space in the application, uh, in this application, increasing the amount of indoor, such that it complies with the zoning bylaw. However, new outdoor amenity space cannot be created, and this results in a minor deficiency of 15 square meters of outdoor space. I note that there is abundant public outdoor space in the immediate vicinity, and staff have um, advised that, in their opinion, this space is appropriate. Third category is parking. There's a minor reduction proposed from 52 to 42 spaces. The transportation report that was mentioned at the outset does um, advise that transportation staff have no concerns with the parking reduction. The fourth category is technical variances, which consist of a change in the first story height to reflect a structural component, permission for stacked bike parking, and minor changes to vertical projections. The slide that you see on the screen now shows where the two additional stories are being added, which is at the 10th and 11th. This uh, maintains the smaller floor plate of the original uh, approval uh, and maintains the intent with respect to setbacks and stepbacks, also limiting shadow impacts. Those two stories allow for 18 additional units, 10 of which are larger two and three bedroom units. Since the 2020 approval, the site has been identified as within two major transit station areas. Um, in addition, since that 2020 approval, there's been a number of other changes in the planning framework, which you will be aware of. I'd simply note Council's pledge to accommodate 285,000 new homes by 2031. The 13 stories proposed, if um, the, can go down a few slides to show the context, is compatible with the surrounding context as it exists today, including uh, a 13 and 15, 15, sorry, 15 and 19 stories. If you could go down just two slides, please. One more, thank you very much. There's, a fifth, there's 15 to 19 story buildings immediately to the south that are long standing. And the mid-rise form at 13 stories represents a transition from the taller forms at the two major intersections to the east and west at Dufferin and Bathurst Street. If you could move two, two slides down to, so that I can briefly touch on density, there's an increase in permitted GFA to reflect the two additional stories. I note, Mr. Chair, that there's no change to the minimum non-res GFA as a retail is continuing to be provided at grade, consistent with the original approval. And the unit mix in terms of two and three bedroom units continues to comply with the original approval. So with that, Mr. Chair, in summary, in my submission, the variances are minor, maintain the general intent and purpose of the official plan and the zoning bylaw and are worthy of approval. They would facilitate new homes in the areas the official plan directs with minimal impact in a manner that maintains the intent of the previous approval. Great, thank uh, therefore, you. just one note with respect to conditions, Mr. Mr. Chair, um, our client is content with the conditions recommended by planning staff the updated conditions recommended by transportation staff, as well as the condition um, imposed by the TTC with respect to technical review. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair. Transportation, I have a uh, note that transportation was requesting deferral, or is that an old note? No, sir, that's an old note. So the updated report that was mentioned at the outset um, reflects discussions that have been had with transportation staff since that time. And in that updated report, transportation staff have confirmed that they have no concerns. I should also note that they've indicated that variance number seven is not required, and therefore variance number seven can be deleted. So you're asking for removing variance number seven? Yes, sir. Thank That's you. Great. Thanks very much. Dylan, did you have questions? Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I know that you didn't have time, so I want to frame this as a question. Um, I was concerned with um, variance number six, and I know that part of the discussion that you had with transportation was about that. Yes. So I'm wondering if you could uh, go into a bit more detail about what your arrangement with transportation is on variance number six. Thank yes. You. Thank you for that question, Mr. Reed. Um, there was a discussion with staff on variance number six. 
Uh, in short, staff advise that they are comfortable with the variance as framed and are, com and are confident that any details can be resolved through the site plan approval process, which is ongoing. There's reference in the report you'll see to the distance of staggering and lifting height. Those two items are not regulated by the bylaw. And so staff, again, are content that that's a matter that's simply a site plan matter that can be resolved through detailed design. Um, just a couple, I'll get to you in a second, but Anneli, just a couple, so going back to the OLT uh, decision, so was that appealed for lack of decision? Correct. Okay. Um, and was there a settlement? There was, a settlement okay. between the city and our client who were the only parties to the appeal. Great, thanks. Um, and secondly, you did note after that there's been a series of policy changes uh, which we're somewhat familiar with, but um, this site is now within a PMTA, MTSA? Within two overlapping PMTSAs. Uh, okay, so the density is quite consistent with what the city's trying to achieve in these areas. Absolutely, sir, and I can say that the minimum density on this site is 2.0. That's the same minimum density that applies to much denser sites such as Honest Ed's to the east. And right. so this is, in fact, quite modest relative to what we see in other similar areas. That's great, thanks very much. Nelly? I have a question about parking. What was the original, what, what number of parking spaces were proposed originally? Yes, the original approval provided for a minimum of 52 parking spaces. What's now proposed is 42. And let me pause there for a moment to note that since the original approval, as you're probably aware, City Council has enacted changes to, this, to parking citywide, which eliminate any minimum parking at all for this site. So there's zero minimum parking required under the base bylaw for this site. The minimum 42 that's requested here simply reflects what is proposed in the building, and staff had asked that we secure that through a variance. Yeah, I was just curious what happened, you know, what caused, you know, the reduction of 10 parking spaces? I, I couldn't see it on drawings. Yeah, yeah, happy to answer that question. A, a couple things in detailed design. One is providing more storage space for the units, and another is providing additional bike parking. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Uh, thank you, sir. It was an excellent presentation. Really Thank appreciate it. Uh, we'll go into committee. Pam? For you, Mr. Chair, actually, that we have two registered oh. speakers. Uh, pardon so, me. Yeah. Pardon so me. We'll, we'll hear Thank from you. Them. No, no problem. Uh, at this time, we will unmute John Stewart. Do we have to get up and dance or anything? Okay. Maybe we'll unmute Mo uh, Laverty. Mo Laverty, you've been unmuted. Hello, <clears throat> uh, I'm name Mo Laverty, address 786 Dovercourt Road. Okay, um, thank you, sir. You have five minutes. And it's ma'am. <laughs> oh, I'm, ma miss, but I'm <clears throat> no not problem. doing well on this file. Thank you, ma'am. Don't call me late for dinner. Uh, I do have concerns about parking. Um, uh, also, nothing to do with the building, but uh, Value Villages is coming in uh, around the corner, just up the street from the new uh, build, um, which is also going to impede parking. Um, we only have street parking in this area, although there is some uh, lots for visitors, um, but I can't put a parking pad on as I'm right on Dover Court, so I can't uh, put a parking pad. So I am concerned about parking. Um, the committee, the transportation committee seems to not be concerned, but of course they don't have to park here. Um, and I do have concerns about the shadow effect. I'm not sure of the um, the uh, ratio of the height and the shadow. <clears throat> I don't know if that's available anywhere um, as we do gardening in the backyard. So I'm not sure how far the shadow would get cast for uh, the additional floors. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so those are my concerns. Um, <clears throat> uh, also, uh, this is uh, Mo's partner, if I may speak, um, live at the uh, same hold address. On, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold just a second. Okay. Yes. Is, is this speaker registered? Through you, Mr. Thank Chair, they can share the five minutes. We just need the first and last name of okay. this next Thank speaker. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, could you uh, give us your uh, name, please? Yes, uh, Christina Starr, S-T-A-R-R. -R. Okay. I live at the same address. Okay, thank you. You have uh, the remaining time. Thanks. Thanks very much for allowing me to speak. So I share Mo's uh, parking concerns. She said we do. We have permit parking here. It's often very difficult to find a spot. Um, so reducing the parking while increasing the residence uh, seems um, 
uh, pro pro problematic potentially. Um, we're not against uh, increasing density of housing, particularly near subway spots, but it's, uh, obviously all those new residents are not going to be non-car owners. Um, also, in terms of the height, and there was a mention of uh, other buildings within the area at 15 and 19 stories south of Bloor Street, those buildings referenced have huge um, outdoor uh, uh, space, our outdoor green space right in front of them. The outdoor green space in this area is actually not that uh, close. There's a Dover Court Park um, about two blocks uh, north of the building. There's really nothing in the immediate area that's actually green space. Um, so just again, it's a concern around um, the amount of people that might be heading to those parks or uh, that might, um, that that's a difference between the 15, 19 story building south of Bloor and the one that's proposed here. So, and again, the shadow effect that um, uh, we will lose sunlight in terms of we live just north of the pr proposed building and we use our backyard um, for urban gardening and, and uh, food sustainability um, and do, do not want that to be affected. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much. Panel, any questions? Uh, do we have the other speaker? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I've tried twice to reach um, John Stewart of 987 Bloor Street West, and I don't see them registered nor in the room. Okay, thanks very much. All right, Mr. Laskin, back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, a few quick comments. First, with respect to parking, as you know, there's abundant transit here, and as I already mentioned, the uh, city's generally applicable bylaw provides for zero parking at all. So here, our client is going further by providing 42 parking spaces. With respect to shadowing, Mr. Chair, um, there was a shadow study conducted, and that shadow study shows that the only potential impact on the property that was identified, and I don't actually believe the shadow does extend that far, but is a single hour, 1118 in December, December 21, when one would not expect any material gardening to be done, sir. Um, the last uh, comment with respect to green space and distinguishing it from the housing immediately to the south, if a land use map could be pulled up um, by the committee, and that's uh, slide number three. Actually, you know what? If slide number one would be just as, uh, slide number one would be just as well if it could be zoomed in. Um, there is a parquet immediately northwest of the site. It's called Westmoreland Parquet, and it transitions to another parquet further to the west called Salem Parquet. It's that continuous, uh, line of trees that you can see just to the northwest of the site, sir. So there is abundant outdoor space, um, one of which is, sorry, both of which are designated parks. And in my submission, um, that uh, does not distinguish the site from the one to the south and in no way affects the appropriateness of the variances. Those are all my comments, sir. Thank you very much. Are you contributing parkland dedication funds? Cash and loose, sir. Because of the nature of a small site on an avenue like this, there's no opportunity for on-site park. Staff had requested cash in lieu. Um, and I note, sir, that the existing approval actually allocates about $400,000 to improve parkland in the area, particularly, particularly Westmoreland Parkette, immediately to the northwest. OK, thank you. Dylan? So, just one clarification. Um, the, we didn't have a chance to see that final transportation um, thing. Is that a condition, or is it just an, uh, uh, an advisory? Um, are you referring to variance number seven? Uh, well, but the whole, there was a document uh, that discussed variance number seven and... Yes, there's a report there, there. Are there any conditions or is it just a, we can take out variance number seven and... I it? don't believe there are any conditions, it's just the removal of variance number seven, if I recall correctly. Okay. Through, through you, Mr. Chair, um, the report is on the screen now. I know it's a little bit difficult, but it, it is in front of you. You, you should be able to see it on your screens. Uh, for variance number five, it states that the applicant is going to enter in a, into a transportation demand management plan during the site plan approval stage. Do we need to do anything to activate that? So that's a question to the agent. Can you confirm that that will be done? It can. I can confirm that that's done as a matter of course as part of the site plan process in any event. If the committee wishes to impose it as a condition, it's of no concern. Sorry, number six. Can we scroll down? 
And through you, Mr. Chair, perhaps maybe the agent can also speak to variance number six and what the agreement was made. Absolutely. Um, this goes back to my uh, discussion with Mr. Reed a moment ago. There were comments provided in respect of variance number six, and just for context, variance number six is the dimensions of the bike parking, the stacked parking. Staff had made some comments which actually suggested that some of the dimensions could be lower than what we proposed. For example, width, they've indicated 0 0.4 is acceptable. We proposed 0 0.45. Um, and then they've made some advisory comments with respect to the way in which those bike parking stalls are positioned. So the staggering, which refers to where the handlebars are relative to one another, and the height. And both of those matters are not regulated by the zoning bylaw. And so staff have advised us that they will uh, address those detailed matters through the site plan process, and our client is agreeable to that. Great. Is that fine? Yeah, can we just scroll down to the bottom where the, the final recommendation? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Any other uh, more questions? Great. Thank you very much. We're in committee. Uh, anyone want to start with some comments or thoughts? Dylan? Um, sure. Uh, I, I, as we, we've seen many of these, of course, um, and I, I think it's important to consider them carefully, but I really appreciate that the agent has addressed a lot of the issues that would normally be uh, questions, and I think uh, successfully. Um, the old, you know, that the OLT was simply with the city, um, that this actually is part of two different um, transit areas that the city has, is in the process of adding to the official plan. Um, uh, so, and you know, it's, it's obviously right on uh, transit. So I, I feel like the, trans, the fact that it's on transit and a bike lane does address some of the parking questions. I, I'm pretty confident that some of the people who buy here will not, will not be needing a car. Um, so, uh, and then my concern was with the bike parking, um, there's no point adding bike parking if that bike parking is really difficult to use, um, but it sounds like uh, planning is addressing the, that and keeping an eye on that, so that's great. Um, so overall, I think it's a, it's a good, pro oh yeah, and there was a little bit of a shadow impact on some sidewalks and such, but you know, I think uh, it's a fair trade-off for the additional housing in a really uh, a desirable location. And I take the fact that uh, planning has specifically recommended approval rather than just saying, you know, if you do this. Um, so overall, I think that this is very supportable. Great. Any further comments? I'll just say I, I think that sometimes the addition of stories is not necessarily a minor variance because of uh, just how far the impacts can go. and, and how short is the actual notice given to people who may be affected by it. But I think this site is a bit distinguishable than some of the other cases uh, demonstrated by the shadow studies. I, I, I think the particular location, you don't see hardly any impact from the increase in two stories. So I would support this. I think it fits. Thanks. Yeah. Um, my concern here was about the parking, the reduction in, in, in parking spaces, and um, but you know after reading the you know the new report, we, <laughs> which we didn't have a chance to read uh, uh, ahead of time, I think it's been addressed. Like if if uh, transportation is okay, if the reduction of number of parking spaces, uh, I think uh, I'm uh, you know I, I agree with that, and uh, uh, particularly because of the location, we have subway, we have you know, a lot of uh, transportation options, and uh, I think in, in, in general it's a very supportable. Yeah. Uh, I would agree with all my colleagues' uh, comments on this one. This is uh, uh, an ideal spot for this kind of uh, intensification and additional density. Uh, I would note to Doug's point that um, Council has in fact asked uh, staff to start reviewing this notion about um, adding additional floors to um, uh, towers that have already gone through the site plan approval process. And uh, I think the agent made a good point that uh, being aware of those, that this one is a little different from some of the ones that have sparked that, that controversy, I'll say. Uh, and I, I think uh, he's made a good uh, presentation that um, uh, this will have very minimal additional impact on the surrounding area. So I think it's supportable. So I'll look for someone for a motion. Dylan. Um, 
So I move that we approve these variances uh, with um, the TTC condition and the planning condition. I, I don't think we need a transportation condition. It sounds like well, we it's a, it's for it's an amended application, so we're oh yeah, and and with the amendment of removing variance number three. Um, and I think uh, the agent noted that there would be some element of the transportation memo that you'd be comfortable with a condition on. Is that? Um, yes, sir. If there's a, if the committee wishes to impose a condition relating to the submission of the transportation demand management um, plan, we're open to that. As I said, that would be done in any event. Yeah, okay. that's actually a good idea. Okay. Do you so want to allow the that? condition, yeah. which was the uh, submission of a transportation demand uh, management? Okay. Fine. Yeah. Great. Uh, I think that covers it well. Thank you very much. I have a seconder. Uh, Mr. Wilkins, all in favor? You have your approval with those conditions, sir. Thank you Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Okay. We move on to item number six, 139 Benson Avenue. This is an application to alter the existing detached two-story dwelling by constructing a side one-story addition. Committee has before it a copy of the plan of survey, site plan, floor plans and elevations, revised site plan, uh, received February the 7th, 2024, 10 photographs of trees on the subject property, covering letter from the agent and an arborist report. We have correspondence and support from 63 Greensides Avenue. Through you, Mr. Chair, we don't have any registered speakers for this item. At this time, we will unmute the agent. Hello, my name is Deborah Mesher. Uh, my address is 198 Melita Avenue, Toronto. Hi, uh, just if you could just speak up a little bit, please. I'm, I didn't catch your name. Oh, yes, it's Deborah Mesher. Great, thank and you. Address is, yeah, okay. Uh, panel, this looks fairly straightforward. Does anyone need a presentation? Any questions? Uh, I just wanted to, uh, there is, no, there aren't any conditions. So um, we've, uh, we don't need a presentation on this application. It seems fairly straightforward. Panel has read all the material and are comfortable with what they've read. Do you have anything you'd like to share with us before we take it into committee? Uh, no, I mean, just that it's a very unusual lot. Um, and so that, that's, that's, a, that's the major component for this application. So just to consider that in, in the neighborhood that it is, but yeah, nothing else. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we're in committee. Panel, any comments on this one? Nelly? I just think from my perspective, it's very straightforward. I would move the option, oh, motion to approve it. Yep, I think that's fair. Seconded by, oh, sorry, oh, Mr. Reed, did you want to say something? Um, well, I'll second it, but I do want to add a friendly amendment to tie it to elevations because it's a one story thing going back to the edge of the lot. So just to make sure that it's just one story. Okay, that's fair. All right, uh, Nelly, are you okay with that as an amendment? Okay, so uh, motion to approve with that condition of tying it to the site plan, uh, moved by Ms. Volport, seconded by Mr. Reed. Thank you very much. Uh, all in favor? You have your approval, ma'am, thank you. We move on to item number seven, which is uh, 181 Hollam Street. This is an application to alter the existing two-story townhouse dwelling by reconstructing and enlarging the rear one-story addition with a rear ground floor deck and reconstructing the rear basement walkout. The committee has before it a copy plan of survey, site plan, floor plans and elevations, three photographs of trees on the property and a staff report from community planning suggesting condition. Do we have the agent? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, and we don't have any registered speakers for this item. <clears throat> Great. Hello, good morning, sir. Morning. Do you have your name and address, please? Yes, it's uh, Chris Xavier, uh, 116 Bowie Avenue, acting as agent uh, representing the homeowners of 181 Hollum Street. Great, thank you. Panel, do you need a presentation on this one? Okay, uh, sir, we don't need a presentation. The panel has read all the material. We're comfortable with what we've read. Is there anything you'd like to share with us before we take it into committee? Uh, no, uh, I will just add that um, 
there is some photos um, as part of my presentation in the extra folder, um, just so you can note, um, you know, the, the main reason why we're reconstructing the addition is because there's structural issues with the foundation. So it was mainly a, a result of wanting to fix it all up and then the increase wasn't the, the need for more space. It was more so once you square everything out and, and make everything meet the code requirement, requirements with the walkout, then uh, there's, a, there's a slight increase in the size. Okay, thank you. And you've seen planning's condition with respect to screening? Yes, yeah, so the, the screening, as you can see in that photo there, is present, um, the one you just passed. So the existing fencing is already there. Uh, we, we do plan to maintain all the fencing. Okay, thank you. All right, we go into committee. Panel, any thoughts, comments? Nelly? I saw yeah. your hand. Uh, no, okay, yeah, yeah, just again, it's straightforward, and I think the the condition by the community planning is uh, is good. So you know, with that condition, I would be supporting. Okay, motion to approve, subject to the planning condition, moved by Ms. Volport, seconded by uh, Mr. Wilkins. All in favor? You have your approval, sir. Thank you. We move on to item number eight which is 135 Gorevale Ave. This is an application to alter the existing two and a half story semi-detached dwelling by constructing a complete third story addition with a front third story balcony. The existing canopy over the front ground floor porch will also be replaced. Committee has before it a copy of plan of survey, site plan, floor plans and elevation, six photographs of the subject property, a cover letter from the agent, and a previous decision uh, affecting the subject property. There is also support, five letters of, form letters of support from 73, 103, 115, 119, and 121 Gorevale Avenue. For you, Mr. Chair, we don't have any registered speakers for this item, and the agent is here in person with us today. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sally Kastner. I'm the architect and agent for 135 Gorevale Avenue. Okay, just hang on a sec. Panel, uh, anyone need a presentation? Uh, since you've come all the way down, maybe just a very quick overview. <laughs> just a one good. minute overview. Uh, okay, so just general purpose um, of the application is to add a third story addition to an existing two and a half story home. Um, this property has been um, Thomas, the owner's property for 13 years, and he lives there with his partner and two kids. And really, the issue is um, there's four adults in three bedrooms and one bathroom, and they're trying to build up primary en suite, um, third floor with a small office for working from home. Okay, great. Thank you, panel. Any questions? Um, I just, uh, sorry, I just got a note. You'll beg my indulgence while I look it up here. Um, the, if you look at the side elevation, um, are you asking for a height variance? Yes. It's a height you look variance. At the side, uh, if you look at the side elevation, the front uh, uh, roof over the balcony is higher than the rest of the house. Is that an architectural design or because that's what is that what's triggering your height variance? Uh, no, so the whole uh, so we're allowed I believe uh, 8.5 meters which those lines the dash lines you see those are the actual allowable heights um, and the top of the balcony just lines up with the top of the parapet. We're trying to kind of hide the parapet from the front. Elevator. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Thank you. Panel, any additional questions? All right, thank you very much. We're going to take it into committee. Any thoughts, comments? Dylan? Uh, this seems really straightforward and a useful addition. Um, so uh, I move, and really quite minor, um, so I move to approve, approve the rights. With, uh, yeah, there's no conditions, so. Great, thanks very much. It's a lovely site. This is the one overlooking Trinity Bell is, right? Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> lovely site. Uh, okay, move to approve by Mr. Reed, seconded by Mr. Wilkins. All in favor? You have your approval, thank, thank you. you. Okay, we move to item number nine, uh, 23 Strathern Boulevard. This is an application to construct a new two, two and a half story detached dwelling with an integral garage, 
covered front porch, uh, a rear ground floor partially covered terrace with stairs, a side cantilevered ground floor terrace, and a rear walk basement walkout. The existing two-story detached dwelling will be demolished. Panel has before it a copy of the plan of survey, site plan, floor plans, and elevations, a revised site plans received February 16th, revised zoning notice received February 16th, an arborist report, presentation materials from the agent, you have staff report from transportation services and urban forestry. We have, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, six form letters in support from one Ridgewood, uh, Ridgewood Road, 12 Millbake, uh, 18 Elderwood, and 20 Glenair Road, and from three Ardmore and 23 Strathern Boulevard. <coughs> Excuse me. We have correspondence and opposition from uh, 2 Millbank Avenue, 340 Lonsdale Road, and from uh, Eldon Freeman with no address provided. Through you, Mr. Chair, we don't have any registered speakers for this item. At this time, we'll unmute David Bronskill. Good morning, Mr. Bronskill. Good morning, Mr. Chair. I hope you can hear me okay. I'm in a slightly different spot, and I don't have my headphones, so I'm relying on my computer microphone. No, we can hear you fine. Thanks very much. Okay, Great. panel, do you need or want a presentation on this one? Might not be a bad idea um, for this is, uh, this an overview. Forestry refusal re recommendation. Ah, so I think we should have a very good point. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bronskill. You've seen the re the, the uh, report from Forestry recommending refusal. So uh, if you could give us a presentation uh, and speak particularly to that recommendation, please. Um, I have to admit, Mr. Chair, I checked this morning and did not see an urban forestry memo on the file. Um, so just hang on I a sec, a David, just hang on yeah. a sec. We'll, we'll find it and pull it up. Just want to go to the chart. Yeah. Oh, oh, too far. Oh, there it is. So there's a uh, recommendation, uh, Mr. Bronskill, to uh, deny variance number eight. Okay. Can you I'm see just it, sir? Pulling up my, I can, and I'm just pulling up my arborist report to look at tree 1W that they're flagging. It's, and, and maybe there's, maybe there's some confusion with urban forestry. Um, tree 1W is a ginkgo tree, 101 centimeters in diameter. It's growing along the city road allowance, um, situated close to the western property line of the property um and i'm just i'm just looking at if you just give me one moment at the tree protection plan one w it, it's it's actually sir not slated for removal um that that tree one w is there is injury, but any, frankly, um, I don't know if staff are, sorry, oh, that's fine. Yeah, if you're in that report, that's great. Thank you to staff. Um, if they can keep going down, you'll see tree 1W. It is a big ginkgo tree there, 101 centimeters in diameter. It's a tree to be injured, not removed. And if staff don't mind going down a little bit further, I can show you on this plan where that tree is located and why any excavation is going to be within that tree protection zone. A little bit further, if staff don't mind, there's a colored plan after the chart. There it is. It's that big tree. Um, you see where it says Vesta Drive, just above it, there's the number 1W. That's the tree. Um, can we, can we and so. That, please? Sorry, David, I just want to get it blown up a little bit so we can see it better. 
That's all right. So there are two small ornamental trees being removed to the on the screen to the right, which is actually to the south. Um, they're slated. They are slated for removal, but they're ornamental trees that the previous owner planted in the in the boulevard. Um, one's a cedar, one's a magnolia, and there would obviously be replanting required for the removal of those two trees. Those those are much smaller trees. They're um, 17 centimeters in diameter for the cedar and the magnolia varies between nine and 14 centimeters. So it's much smaller. It's that ginkgo tree to the left. Um, uh, it's slated for injury because there's obviously some construction and there would be for any as of right, um, uh, but the tree itself is not slated for removal. Can I just beg your indulgence for one moment and ask staff, can you pull up the Google Street View of this site? Is it possible to do that? No? The Google Street View? Could you just pull that up on the screen? Uh, Mr. Bronskill, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I think part of our review, we visit the site or we review the site, and I just want to confirm, because we have letters of opposition that are speaking specifically to the tree m removal issue. And I, I think the yeah. panel wants yeah. to be clear about which trees uh, we're talking about. So uh, I don't know, do we have that ability or not? There are, if it's helpful, Mr. Chair, there are pictures in the report. So I, I, the reason I'm raising this, report. David, is they're, they're on Google Street View, uh, on Vesta, if you look there, there is a really quite rather large mature tree that currently has hoarding around it, but uh, I, I presume that's in respect of demolition. But there's a really rather large tree, and I want to make sure that we're clear about what tree forestry is referring to because this looks like it would be a large tree, and I want to confirm through you whether this is what your what your site plan speaks to with respect to this tree yeah. and that's that's tree 1w that's the large tree yeah it's a really large tree it looks like it's the closest yep. one to vespa yeah it is that's the 101 centimeter diameter ginkgo that's tree 1w that staff are referring to in their report okay. and that is not slated for removal it is slated for injury but any, any construction within the Azerite envelope would be within the tree protection zone. Okay. Sorry, um, just uh, to quick. So uh, the current plans, though, go beyond the Azerite in the direction of the tree. Is that correct? They, they, they do. That is correct. Okay. Um, the plans have on that side instead of a three uh, meter setback have the 1.22 meter setback but the existing dwelling in green is even within the tree protection zone so the the color site plan uh, just for the committee's benefit that we that we provided in our package shows the red as of right the green existing home and then the proposal at 1.22 from that setback so it all of those fall within the tree protection zone for that tree. But the current plans would be closer to the tree, correct? They would be, yes. So there is a, uh, Mr. Bronsko, there is a photograph of the tree in wintertime attached to the uh, forestry staff report, which you, you haven't seen? Uh, no, I hadn't seen until just now. Okay, can we just uh, pull up staff, uh, forestry's staff report? Uh, and if you go down, yeah, there, just, yeah, there. Uh, David, can you see that on the screen? Yes, that's the tree. Okay, so your, your view is that that tree will not be removed. It may be subject to some damage as a result of the construction. 
Uh, that's right. There will be an injury. And it's funny. I now I'm online. The reports now posted and available online. It's dated March 27th, which is today. Okay. On the, on the portal. So I, I do now see it. Um, I do now see that they've got five, which was request denial. Uh, and I'm just, if you just for a moment, Mr. Chair, I'm just going to look at the second half of the report. Yeah, I, where where I have a dispute, I guess, with urban forestry staff is that it, it won't require the removal. It will require uh, a permit to injure, uh, which we acknowledge we'll have to file an application for. We are we are not on the site plan proposing it for removal. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, we'll we'll stand that issue down. Uh, if you could give us a an overview of your application in general, please. I can do that for sure, Mr. Chair. So um, the the application materials they have in front of you, um, we've provided some of the usual materials in an effort to be of assistance. Uh, the site plan showing the permitted building envelope, uh, the green, uh, the existing, and then you can see the three-story structure that's proposed um, with the variation in the floor going up. There was a question in one of the objection letters, you know, is this two and a half or three stories? We acknowledge it is a three-story home, but the way it's proposed with a sloped roof and then the dormers on the Vesta Drive side, some might look at it and say it's a two and a half story dwelling, but we, we acknowledge that 100% there is a third story within that roof uh, that is um, that has GFA on it, about 102 square meters of GFA to contribute to the overall design. We did, just for the committee's benefit, include a chart of um, FSIs that have been approved in the area. We looked only at the density zone for 0.65, um, and you can see that there is quite a range of FSIs approved in the area. Uh, that's just the, the quantitative aspect of the FSI. The color site plan we think is helpful in understanding the size of the dwelling itself. What I wanted to point out for the committee's benefit, and you've probably heard me talk about this before in terms of length and depth, is that while the length at 22.09 meters um, does obviously exceed the bylaw requirements, that's measured from the front protruding bay window. Um, again, that's also where the front yard setback is measured to at 10.34 that we're seeking. So it's that architectural projection on the front, which is really uh, almost a bay window. Um, and you'll be able to see that on the last page of the rendering. It's then measured to the back of the excavated uh, basement below the deck. The dwelling itself, if you see it, is um, actually has a length of just under 17 meters on the first floor to, and I'm going to ask staff's indulgence to act as a bit of my Vanna White here and pointing at something for you on the site plan. Sorry to make staff scroll. On the top left, I just wanted to show the committee, there are two staggers. There's one little bump, and then there's a larger bump out for the breakfast nook. The main dwelling, if you exclude that bay window at the front, and on the top left, go to that first little square cutout, that's actually 17 meters. So to the back of the breakfast nook is about another two meters. So the most of the dwelling is 17 meters. As you come up through the second floor, um, it's actually a little bit less. Uh, it's 16.08 meters. And the third floor within the roof line, the actual um, length of the space that's usable there is about 13 meters. So, so we have these slightly longer length and depths but they're not for the full above grade structure. They're just in terms of how the bylaw measures it from the front of that projecting bay window to the back of the excavated basement. I do think this is one of those cases where if you see fit to grant the length and depth variances, that construction be substantially in accordance with the site plan so that it's not redeployed, the, the, the above grade dwelling is not redeployed at a greater length than what is actually shown on the architectural plans. Um, otherwise, the variances themselves, we think are uh, resulting in a, in a nicely sized home. 
There is, um, uh, on the VESTA side, a reduction in that side year to 1.22, but it's resulting, we think, in a, a house that's 10.66 meters wide, which is just a better usable space overall. Uh, cutting it down by um, another meter and a half or so would make it a tighter dwelling in uh, the width of the dwelling. And so we think that side yard setback just makes for a nicer uh, design um, without having any meaningful impacts. So uh, I'm happy to take any questions, but those overall are, are um, my presentation to you in terms of the variances before you. Great. Panel, questions? Nelly? Uh, my question is uh, with regards to this uh, platform on the west side. And if yes. you can speak to that, it, it just looks like an architectural detail, but is there any you know, necessity to this, uh, uh, let's say, <laughs> to this uh, platform? It, it is a nice architectural detail. I think that's a fair consideration of it, although it is also usable uh, space. It's intended as a very small terrace that's actually off the dining room area of the dwelling. So where that platform is located, it's actually in line with the dining area and would just allow, frankly, open doors and a small little walkout area there uh, adjacent to the dining room. Uh, Mr. Brunt, I just wanted to um, kind of get back to your point about the forestry report. You had mentioned that it, you had March 27th on. I just want to, for the record, note that the memo we have on file is dated March 19th. So it's a it's a bit of a mystery as yes. to how it uh, how it didn't get on. Through you, yes, Mr. Mr. Chair, I acknowledge that. Okay, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, this, this was a staff error. It wasn't posted on the AIC. That's why the agent wasn't able to view ah, the letter. Okay. So it is, it is. There you go. Error. You're redeemed, sir. So, um, so it just got posted. <laughs> I, I That's why it's showing 20th, up as March 27th. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But, uh, the material no, we have. For that one. Sorry, Mr. Chair, go ahead. Yeah, the material we had uh, had the memo dated uh, March 19th, so it was in our package, so just so you know. Yeah. Um, I am a little bit concerned uh, that the agent and the applicant hasn't had the chance to uh, fully discuss this further with forestry. I'd um, like maybe a deferral's north. Yeah, I was just going to say right? that, you know, uh, you, you look at the site, this is a very large tree. Uh, it contributes significantly to the canopy of this area, which frankly, which what makes this area so desirable is the fact that the trees and the canopy in it. And uh, if there is some confusion about the status of this tree, I think we'd all benefit perhaps by uh, allowing the participants to get some clarity about this. I, I would note that uh, in looking at the letters that were submitted, most of the letters in support were from somewhat distant from this site. Most of the letters in opposition were from those very close or immediately adjacent. So uh, a deferral for your consideration uh, would be something not only to address the forestry condition, but I think an opportunity for the applicant to have substantive discussions with the surrounding and adjacent neighbors. And, and possibly adjust the Mr. plans. So, uh, Mr. Bronsko, I'll go back to you. Before we go into committee and have this uh, full, more fuller discussion, uh, we're considering a deferral for the reasons I've spoken to. Um, Mr. Chair, one clarification on letters of objection. I, I actually looked at them today. They're, they're not actually proximate neighbors. Um, one, one, as I saw it, was on 2 Millbank, which is at the end of the street where Strathern meets Millbank. It's not one of the adjacent neighbors. I saw one from 340 Lonsdale, which is actually um, across the green area to the, to the south of the proposal um, and, and isn't within the immediate geographic area. And the third does not have an address. So they're, they're not proximate neighbors. Fair point. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, 
I'm not quite sure, you know, of, of their specific interest in this tree, but they're, they're not proximate neighbors. My, my only pitch to the committee is the alternate recommendation of urban forestry staff is that, you know, we would need a permit. It is a, it is a city owned tree. Um, we, we need a permit from them uh, regardless. We're not proposing removal, we're proposing injury. Um, and, you know, we'd be prepared to go through that permit process with urban forestry and discuss it with them. Um, so the, the condition, the alternate conditions that they proposed in their memo uh, would be acceptable to us and would allow that process to occur and those discussions uh, to occur. Um, and we're happy to have those discussions with them as part of uh, obtaining any permit. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it is a city owned tree that, that we think um, is one that, um, uh, uh, you know, can and should be preserved and we would work with them in that regard. Okay, so you, you would prefer to proceed without a deferral? If, if possible, I mean, if, if, if imposing the alternate urban forestry conditions for us to seek the required permits causes the committee some concern, um, I, rather than having a refusal, Mr. Chair, I don't think there's any secret, I'd rather the deferral. Um, but I do think those alternate conditions would ensure appropriate protection for the tree. But, but if that's causing the committee concern, I'd, I'd prefer the deferral rather than having to appeal to T-Lab, obviously. Great. Thanks very much. Any further questions of the agent? Nelly? No? Okay. We're in committee. Comments? Just, uh, I have a general concern with the width of this uh, residence, uh, and I think the depth uh, um, variances were explained really well, but I don't, like, there is an extension, you know, the, or the, you know, the width of the residence was enlarged, and uh, especially with the addition of that platform, and which causes, you know, those you know, problems with the urban forestry and concerns of the, you know, of the neighbors. So um, I think uh, we have two variances uh, related to the west cantilever platform, which is variance number one and the variance number eight, which urban forestry is talking about. And I would, um, if we are, um, you know, if we're inclined to accept this application, I would suggest those two variances to be, you know, to strike them. Okay, okay. Dylan. Um, yeah, I mean. Uh, to be honest, I was thinking of refusal um, following forestry's support. I mean, variance eight is pretty fundamental to the current plans. So, like, you'd have to replan the house. Um, I, I don't really see. Uh, but given that uh, there was a staff error um, and that the applicant didn't really have time to process and confer with his clients about the forestry condition, I think that a deferral would be appropriate. Um, not just for them to talk to forestry, but also perhaps to, well, it's clear from forestry that, I mean, the applicant's saying we're not gonna cut down the tree, but clearly forestry feels that putting a foundation through the ground um, 1.2 meters from the tree is gonna kill it. Um, otherwise forestry would not have made this thing. So uh, whether or not the, the applicant plans to cut down the tree, forestry feels that the current plan will kill the tree. Um, and uh, I think this tree is, obviously one that is worth saving. So um, I would suggest deferral uh, to give a chance for the applicant to confer with his clients, um, possibly to confer with forestry and see what kind of a redesign of their plan might, uh, might be acceptable to forestry, um, uh, given the staff error. I Great, think is the reason. Doug? Sorry about that. I, I tend to agree with Mr. Reed. I think most of the concerns we've heard from residents, wherever they might actually be located, has to do with the tree. Uh, urban forestry is concerned with the tree. And I, I don't think there was notice. And I think if, um, if we're going to think about perhaps imposing conditions or something, and if the tree is such a big issue, it might be more helpful to hear directly from the arborist from the applicant side and, and, and not having us make a decision without expert opinion. So I think I, I would move for deferral. 
Great. I, I would agree uh, with my colleagues about the uh, deferral for the reasons they've cited. Uh, I, I, this is a rather majestic tree, uh, a fairly significant contributor to the canopy in this area. And uh, given the uncertainty about the status of forestry's recommendations, I think it would be worthwhile for the agent or the applicant to confer with forestry and clarify this for the panel. So uh, I'll look to a motion, a uh, panel for a motion. Mr. Reed, uh, I will. I'll move to defer um, for the reasons uh, described. Okay. Second, Mr. Wilkins. All in favor? Uh, okay. It's unanimous. Uh, uh, Mr. Bronskill, your application is deferred, and uh, if you could follow up and have discussions with forestry, and if there are any additional discussions that needed with the surrounding neighbors, uh, that would be helpful as well. Application is deferred. Okay, we move on to the next item, which is item number 10, 386 Concord Avenue. This is an application to construct a new two-story laneway suite. The committee has before it a copy of the plan of survey, site plan, floor plans, and elevations, five photographs of trees on the subject property, covering letter from the agent, and planning rationale from the agent. Correspondence in support from 392 Concord and 382 Concord. Correspondence in opposition from 390 Concord, 388 Concord. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we do have the agent here in person with us. We also have two registered speakers in opposition. Great, thank you very much. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Is your mic on? Light is okay. There we are. Okay, my name is Christian Chan. I'm the planning uh, consultant for the owner, Marissa Jennigan, who is the um, owner of 386 Concord Avenue. My address is Suite 138157 Adelaide Street, West Toronto, Ontario. Great, thanks very much. You have five minutes, sir. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, we're seeking a variance for a new laneway suite. That's the purpose of the application, but just to clarify this, is that um, there were a number of iterations of a zoning review that went uh, to building permit, and in fact, this laneway suite it has been substantially constructed with a permit. And so the variances that are before you today are retroactive variances to a new zoning notice that was produced because of an application for building permit to rebuild the rear addition that is an enclosure to access the two rental suites in the building from the rear. So I'm just going to stop you there for a second. Um, Sabrina, do we need to change the purpose of this application then? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the agent can let us know what changes need to be made to that purpose. I think he's saying it's not to construct a laneway suite, it's to make uh, renovations to the main dwelling. Well, if I can clarify, sir, so I did discuss this with uh, the application technician on this file, and because the variances were identified to the lane suite itself, is that the purpose of the application had to be issued on the basis of a new laneway suite rather than the proposed uh, reconstruction of the rear addition? So could we then combine it to say it's to construct and make renovations to? Through you, Mr. Chair, no, because that's not what was circulated as part of the original notification. The three variances that are before you today have to deal with the laneway suite. Okay, so yes. we'll just leave it as is. Not with the rear addition. Okay. The so main house. We will leave it as is then. Yes, sir. Thank Sorry, you. I interrupted you. Uh, please continue. Uh, thank you, sir. So uh, just to... Uh, direct staff to turn to page two of my planning rationale that shows a photo of the existing rear stair enclosure. Um, so I'd just like to note again that this lane suite is an interesting situation, sir, in that uh, this is, you know, construction had proceeded with a permit on this lane suite that is already uh, approved to be above the, uh, the maximum permitted six meter height of a laneway suite and um, the permit was issued to that effect as well. So this is a retroactive variance for the height in seeking a 6.11 meter um, laneway suite variance that is already substantially constructed and that had been approved above six meters. 
So the reason why that variance was identified is because upon the submission of the building permit for the rear stair enclosure, a new zoning notice was issued and recognized that a permit had been issued by Toronto Buildings for a laneway suite that was already above six meters and therefore we're before you here today to seek a relief of uh, that uh, oversight. Um, so just to turn to um, the rationale for the variances. I'd also like to go to page three of the planning rationale that shows um, that the lane suite has been substantially constructed. And also on page 33 of my planning rationale, you can see that there is the building permit. Um, and also, actually page 10. Page 10 is record of the building permit being issued. And then page 33 is the stamped plans from the Toronto Buildings Department that shows that that uh, above six meter height had been approved by Toronto Buildings for construction. So just in terms of the requested variances, um, the rationale for the minimum separation distance variance, um, if I do have a picture of the site plan that can depict this on page five of my planning rationale. If you can zoom into the bottom of the page, so I can see it's quite small on the screen here. But the proposed replacement basement stair enclosure extends beyond the existing rear main wall of the building and establishes the determination of what the new rear main wall position is. This is what was not established upon the uh, building permit submission for the lane suite originally. Um, and in the subsequent zoning review in November 2023, it was identified for the reconstruction of that particular element. Uh, since the new rear main wall is determined to be established at the extent of the westerly wall of the basement stair enclosure, the minimum separation distance is now established in the new zoning review, which is the subject to the variance before you here today, of 7.5 meters to the rear main wall of that addition instead of the rear main wall of the main house. So with respect to the angular plane penetration, this is, this is also similar in that the new angular plane, the new point at which the angular plane is established is from 7.5 meters from that uh, rear stair enclosure. So therefore, where the building permit was issued for the current, con currently almost constructed laneway suite is now falls within that seven meter distance and therefore also falls within the uh, point at which the angular plane has been established in the new zoning review. The actual distance between the laneway suite itself is 8.7 meters to the actual rear main wall of the building. Those are the habitable areas of the building. The function of that existing addition to be replaced is in fact a stairwell enclosure to access the basement rental suite and the main floor rental suite that's in the building. So there's existing rental units in the building and my owner seeks to improve the rental housing stock in the city by um, obviously the laneway suite itself, but also maintain and improve and maintain the functionality of the existing uh, two rental units in the building, both in the basement and on the main floor. So if we can go back to page two, those photos, I can show you, in fact, what's being proposed in the revised uh, submission to the city for this uh, stair enclosure, as you can see in the upper left image, that the rear portion of that addition is actually being um, eliminated, that was just a storage shed area. And, and so the addition, in fact, is, is being shortened from what it exists now. So with respect to the lane suite height variance of 6.11 meters, so this variance had been identified upon the subsequent zoning review for the replacement of this basement uh, stair enclosure. And it should have been identified upon the initial zoning review for the lane suite uh, that was produced, I believe, sometime in February 2023. And I have that zoning review. And the, the zoning review from February uh, 2023 identified two variances to the proposed laneway suite at the time of, of a laneway suite building length and also a uh, deficiency of soft landscaping. Those um, variances were complied with. So, in all respects, this, except for the height, which was a variance missed upon the first per building permit review and zoning review, the laneway suite would otherwise comply with all the performance standards in Chapter 150.8 of uh, Bylaw 569. Thanks, sir. Uh, you have uh, gone by your five minutes, so we're going to close you off there. I think we understand your perspective. Panel, any questions? Okay, we have a couple of speakers. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, we will unmeet, unmute Jenny. Hello, Hello, Jenny. Hi there. Hi. Um, are you 
Good, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Are you able to see me or is my video turned off? You can turn on your video. <clears throat> I think we can put you in as a panelist and then, yep, turn on your video. There you are. And are you speaking on behalf of your parents? So yes, I'm speaking on behalf of my parents, Clara and Jose Vivar, that reside at 388 Concord. Okay. I have my own home, but I also obviously live there as well as they are my parents. Um, so I, I did send um, my letter of objection, of course. Um, and I also did initially was thinking about requesting a deferral, but I feel that I do have enough information to, to challenge these variances. So I'm actually gonna go, um, I'm gonna outline these verbally. So the variances are not minor. This was approved based on erroneous information, information provided by the applicant. The added dimensions are going to impact my parents' enjoyment of the property they have lived at for 36 years. Variances are intended to ensure uniformity in the neighborhood and to provide homeowners with some comfort that they aren't going to create a home and that someone is going to build some enormity next to them. So this doesn't mean that we're not opposed to laneway homes, but the protections are in place to ensure that both parties are heard and a decision is made balancing both interests. In this case, the laneway home was built first and the city has only realized that they did so improperly months after the fact. So I just also wanna detail how this is going to impact my parents. The oversized, the oversized structure infringes upon their privacy. It impacts the overall enjoyment of their backyard. It obstructs the crucial sunlight needed for their garden's growth and their overall well-being. And what it also does is it creates a precedent for the neighborhood. Others may do the same. And allowing these variances would mean rewarding someone for breaking the law. So I also went through some of the letters that were submitted into the 386 portal, and I did come across Mr. Chang's letters asking the city to relieve the owner of 386 Concord of this, these three variances. Um, I came across a letter dated Wednesday, March 15th, 2023 from Syllable Architects, clearly stating that examining the building permit revealed that certain requirements by bylaws have not been satisfied. Then on December 6th, Christian Chan submitted a letter asking for relief. And then again, Christian Chan submitted another letter on March 20th, asking for relief yet again. So my questions are this, why weren't these variances communicated to the adjacent neighbors and the neighborhood com community before the building was constructed? Um, it was fly already flagged to the builder and the owner of 386 Concord Avenue on all these dates. Why weren't my parents and the community also addressed? I'd also like to share that my parents were becoming concerned that the laneway home was being constructed much larger than it was intended. And the owner of 386 Concord Avenue did take my parents through a PowerPoint presentation that she put together about a year ago before construction. And the photo references that she shared with them were considerably smaller than the enormity the laneway house is today. Um, as you can see that there are a couple of letters of, of objection. I did speak to some of the neighbors in the neighborhood and something that I discovered were many of the neighbors were confused by the application's wording. Um, clearly stated the purpose of the application reads to construct a new two-story laneway home. This information right here is misleading because that application should have been submitted months before construction. Um, so we do have also a letter in support, but if you read that letter in support by David Michael, there is no reference to the variance whatsoever cited. Um, so that's my understanding that he may have been inadvertently supportive of the variances without understanding its implications. There's also another letter of uh, objection from our adjacent neighbor at 390 Concord Avenue stating, if properties do not comply with the law, do not follow proper measurements or permits or, or obtain the proper permits, then they should be rebuilt properly according to the building code, safety code, and all codes set by the municipality. Um, 
So I, I just want to leave uh, the committee with some clo closing remarks. My parents, Jose and Clara Vivar, are seniors. They have been law-abiding citizens who have resided in Canada since 1974, making 388 Concord their home since 1988. It's evident that the Laneway House project exceeds legal limits in terms of depth and height, indicating that it's larger than permitted. This oversight structure infringes upon their privacy, obstructing the sunlight crucial for their garden's growth and overall well-being. We're also bravely concerned that this will adversely impact the resale potential of their home. The laneway houses imposing an unfortunate miscalculated dominates the size of their backyard, likely deterring potential buyers. We are not opposed to laneway homes. We understand that this is uh, um, an essential project for the city of Toronto, but the variances are not minor. And should the laneway house at 386 Concord Avenue not comply with legal requirements, the laneway house must be taken down and restructured to meet all municipality codes and standards. Ma'am, I'm sorry. I'm the just going to I'm just going to interrupt you there. You've uh, exceeded your time, um, and thank you for your input. Uh, your parents are not speaking today. No, but they 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 weren't unfortunately able to. Um, join the link they're actually overseas but they are watching via youtube okay thank you very much uh that's it for the speakers okay mr chan back to you great thank you mr chair uh so with respect to dimensions that are erroneous and i, I thank the neighbor for her comments today um for obvious reasons i respectfully disagree um, the only variance of substance I believe that is before you today is with respect to the 6.11 meter height request because that, again, in all other respects, the proposed lane suite or the existing constructed lane suite is complying with all performance standards of Chapter 150.8 if the rear addition had not been constructed or it would be eliminated. There wouldn't be any variances before you here today except for the height variance that was an erroneous uh, oversight by city staff upon the initial building permit submission. And also since the lane suite was constructed, I can understand uh, Ms. Vivar's concerns with respect to how the lane suite proceeded to construction, but just to advise as well, as, as in my experience too, is that once you submit for a building permit, and a building permit is approved, that is not a public process, whereas the Committee of Adjustment is a public process. So the construction would have proceeded anyways without notification to the neighbors because there's no statutory requirement to notify adjoining neighbors or within a 250 meter circulation distance from an, a building permit application. So the only time that the neighborhood would have been circulated is of course upon the submission of the permit for the reconstruction of the rear stair enclosure and the identification of the variances for or to the laneway suite from that element. Um, with respect to the letters of objection, I, I do wish to note that four out of the six of the letters of objection were sent in by one address, and um, all the support letters uh, acknowledge what the variances are for. So there's been a clear method of outreach uh, from my client to the adjoining neighbors that have clarified anything that the neighbors wish to know about. Um, and as stated by Ms. Vivar as well, is that in fact, even before constructing the building permit, uh, the, the laneway suite, and before even getting a building permit, she reached out to her neighbors with her intent to build a laneway suite. So I don't see, uh, in, in my view, where there's been a lack of communication. Um, adjacent to the south, the neighbors in support, and uh, you can read from the various support letters too that the neighbors understand what's going on here and that the variances, although the stated purpose is with respect to a new laneway suite, that it is clear that it is in regards to the reconstruction of the rear uh, basement, one story addition. And also just to add to that too is that, that and I have mentioned it in my, uh, my chief submission here, is that um, this is an uninhabited rear addition. It's a staircase enclosure that goes down and goes up. 
So if this addition were to be a two-story rear addition with habitable areas with windows, certainly there would be discussion upon uh, what sort of impacts would be of the lane suite to a habitable area in the building. But again, as I mentioned, uh, the distance from the lane suite itself to where there are windows and where there are living areas in the main house is 8.7 meters, so well, well beyond the 7.5 meters. And in fact, uh, counter to Ms. Vivar's claims, the lane suite, if that rear addition wasn't there, could in fact be built and constructed closer to the main house. It is not. Uh, with respect to resale potential of adjacent properties, and I can understand that uh, many times before you there are statements made to the committee with regards to property values, and I, I submit to you that that simply is not uh, a matter for the committee to consider with respect to the impact of uh, land values as a result of minor variance applications. And I thank you. Thanks. Uh, Pam, uh, D Dylan? I just wanted to clarify. So um, the, the new small rear addition that you're going to build is actually going to have a smaller footprint than the former one, is that correct? That's correct, sir. Okay. Do you know by how much? I would expect about eight feet. So if on page two, um, well, the survey does show the extent of the existing uh, shed as part of that addition, but I think it's better depicted. Um, so if you can zoom into the rear section there, it does in fact show to the extent of what the existing addition is. And then what you can see from the proposed plans and also um, what's shown in the images is that section that goes beyond the existing rear addition of the adjoining property is going to be shortened to match it. Oh, okay. Thank you. That, that, that helps. Okay. Anyone else? Nelly? Uh, just to clarify as well, so the, the minimum uh, requested distance of 7.5 meters, is it from the main wall? You, you, we are talking about the main wall, not including the addition. No, so the, uh, and thank you for the question, ma'am. The, the distance to the main wall of the house is 8.7 meters. Okay. The variance is being requested to the rear main wall of the addition because under the zoning bylaw, the definition of the rear main wall is a wall that's supporting any structure above it. And in that case, that the zoning examiner would determine that the established rear main wall of the building is the rear main wall of the addition the one-story addition, the stair enclosure. Okay. okay. Anyone else? Thank you very much, sir. We'll take this into committee. Thoughts and comments? Uh, yeah, so um, <laughs> to be honest, uh, these are actually pretty minor variances. Um, I, I, I do sympathize with the you know bureaucratic complication that's happened and also with the confusion that's created in, in the na for the neighbors. Um, but I would say that even if this had been brought before us before construction, we probably would have allowed it. Um, the, 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 the height is just a matter of inches. Um, really, the other ones are triggered just by this small addition. Um, uh, and as, as the agent pointed out from the house itself, they wouldn't even be triggered. Um, I, I do see from the images that it does seem quite imposing, but it's really like even if it was built, um, it, even if it was just uh, six meters as opposed to 6.11 meters, it would still be imposing. Um, uh, so really, uh, obviously, it's changes like this are difficult, but this, this is the kind of thing that was actually envisioned in the laneway bylaw, and I, I think we absolutely allow, uh, allow. Do you want to make a motion to that effect? Oh, you had a comment? Pardon me. Yeah, I just uh, had some concerns about this uh, laneway suite. And um, I understand we are talking about technicalities quite a lot. But you know, looking at the massing of the structure, and uh, especially referring to the angle of plane and you know, how, it, um, you know, how it sits on the lot, I think it's a very imposing structure. And um, uh, so, and again, you know, there's flat roof, so you know, no. Like from my perspective, I don't see any consideration, you know, you know, given to trying to reduce the massing of the building, and that's why I, I have my concerns about that. That wanted to share with the members. They do. They do have a. Um, they do have an angular plane facing the house. It's just obviously not quite enough. Then. 
I, I suppose the way I'm looking at it is um, when you look at uh, chapter 158, 60, 40, the height that would be allowed if that small structure uh, that I believe contains the staircase uh, is, if that wasn't there, they would be allowed to build to, uh, what is it, 6.3 meters? That was an, a, an amendment that was made to the original laneway suite bylaw. Right, so, so for, for a house with this overall massing, the height of 6.11 meters, I think, um, although it seems a lot from what the bylaw allows, I think in the overall context, it's actually a minor. Yeah, I would, uh, I would agree. I think that for all intents and purposes, this is almost an as of right laneway suite. I, I mean, you know, and to your point, Doug, if it wasn't for the, uh, the, um, the covered um, stairway, it would fully comply. Uh, so take your point about massing, but uh, this is not, um, in my view, um, a, a laneway suite that uh, uh, its massing exceeds what the bylaw and what the council was looking to achieve with this type of uh, activity. I think the, the variances before us are actually quite minor. So I, I, I would agree with uh, you and I'll look for a motion. Sure, I'll make a motion. Uh, I move that we approve these variances okay. for the reasons discussed. Do you, uh, would you be open to tying it to the site plan just so that the uh, enclosure yeah. stays at one story? Yeah, tie and, and uh, with the condition of tying it to the site plan, for sure. That's good. Seconder? Mr. Wilkins, all in favor? Okay, opposed? Okay, you have your approval, sir, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Do you anyone need a short break? Okay, why don't we take, do you need five or 10? Take a short 10 minute break. It's your birthday? Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Oh, is there a microphone on the Oh, Nelly, your, uh, Nelly, your, your microphone's. Uh, uh, yeah, we're good. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it was my birthday last week. Uh, sorry, no, two weeks ago on the on the Ides of March. Oh, 32, oh, 33, sorry. You're still a young fella. Do you think I would be 23 years old working here? <laughs> I, was being, I was being kind. I'd be oh, crying sorry. every day if I was working here in my 20s. <laughs> that looks Are crazy. these for anybody there? Yeah, yeah, I brought them. Yeah, well, you go right ahead. I'm, uh, yeah. I am sadly that I'm
in the new apartments, um, this Wi-Fi Park Station, there's like older buildings, which I actually really enjoyed living in. Um, yeah, for all sorts of reasons, I really enjoy living there. Yeah, I've seen friends who lived around there before, and now they live in a condo in the city. Yeah, every village is fun for like a bit. Because I grew up adjacent to it as well, so like, there was always kind of like, not much in Liberty Village, but I guess it's like all slowly trickling in, but it just kind of feels weirdly like, secluded. It feels like a suburb. Yeah, I think just because of the rail, the rail kind of really blocks it off, and also just like, it's still quite car dependent in that area too. There's like, so much parking. I know that um, so they're extending the West Rail Path to go to Liberty, but I think they're just waiting for Metrolink to finish their work on their portion of the on the rail path, and then they'll extend it further south. Um, but yeah, interesting.
Ready to go? Okay, welcome back everyone. We move on to item number 11. Oh, uh, uh, pardon me. We did have a uh, deferral. That's right. My, my apologies. Thank you, Sabrina. And turn my camera on. Oof. Okay. We move on to item number 12. Three eighty three Spadina Road. The purpose of this application is to alter the existing two story mixed use building by constructing a new outdoor patio along with the front side of the building. Along the front side of the building. The committee has before it a copy of the plan of survey and site plan, eight photographs of the subject property, cover letter from the agent, correspondence from uh, Spadina Village Investment Corp. Which, who is the applicant, uh, presentation material from the agent and site-specific bylaws affecting the subject property. We have correspondence uh, with the zoning uh, examiner received uh, February 27th. Through you, Mr. Chair, we don't have any registered speakers for this item. At this time, we'll unmute Michael Goldberg. Great, thank you. Mr. Goldberg. Um, good morning, members of committee. So, I don't know if you need a presentation at all. I'm in your hands. Panel, anyone need a, maybe a short presentation, sir? Okay, I put together a visual presentation, if that could be put on the um, screen for a moment. Okay, and if you could go, just start at page four. Right there, thank you so much. Members of the committee, my name is Michael Goldberg. I'm the planning consultant for uh, the owners and applicants. This is a um, existing uh, restaurant building right in the middle of Spadina Village, which is uh, in Forest Hill Village. It, um, uh, since 2011, it's been an aroma, and um, aroma had on this building a, um, an outdoor patio exactly as illustrated on the plan right here. So from about 2011 to about a year ago, aroma had existed, aroma has vacated, and um, a new tenant, Landwer, um, has come in to re-tenant the building. So they are proposing to reinstate the patio exactly as shown on the plan here in the same location as um, Aroma has. So in getting their building permits, the zoning examiner had indicated that there is some zoning non-conformities, the two variances that are before you. And we are here to simply ask the ability to reinstate what's been there for um, since 2011, effectively. Um, if you could then go to uh, two pages over, not that one, the next one. Okay, so this is the new building. So there's a, you could see the sidewalk, you could see where some chairs are located. We have put in or, or in, or in red where the, the patio will be. There's a small parking area at the south end the building. Um, if you could go to the, the next slide, please. So on the left hand side, that's the aroma. We, we, we were able to get a picture of that. And in fact, this is a, an area, this strip along Spadina, uh, in Spadina Village or Forest Hill Village, where there are a number of outdoor patios. And in fact, um, I think it's called Dine To, where during COVID, they started the outdoor patios within the public boulevard. And you could see in the foreground where the, um, the Dine Teo has created a patio like off the curb and on the street right away. And then beyond which next to the store has been the, was the patio that's been existing since 2011. And that's where we wish to reinstate it. 
The photograph on the right is, we put the red on, is, um, is the concrete pad. Now I'm just gonna say there's two variances before you. So there is a, um, there is a 1967 bylaw that says no part of a building is located closer to the east limit of Spadina Road than 10 feet. So they are considering this six inch high platform, it's probably might be even a bit less than six inches, um, as part of the building. The, um, the um, right side of the platform is the zero lot line and um, they're considering that part of the building. And I, I, I really do consider this to be highly technical in nature because clearly there's no mass in. There's, you know, basically a normal riser up. If you could go to the next slide, please. So these are other, we've got the map on the side. The subject site is in red. And you can see that there's a second cup, there's what a bagel, there's Starbucks in the neighborhood. And they all have, um, in various forms, um, uh, in various forms, um, outdoor patios. The 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 variance relating to the setback to the neighborhood. If you can go back to page four, please. Okay, that is the variance. The red line that says twelve point two two. There are homes on the other side, as there are homes everywhere adjacent on the east side of uh, Forest Hill Village. And, um, um, you know, there's no one here, there's no one that has written in who has complained about uh, the reinstatement of this patio in this location. It's kind of technical because it's through the building as opposed to walking around the building. Um, but in any event, um, this is an area that um, is quite a vibrant commercial strip. We think that this addition of this um, um, this patio would contribute to that vibrancy. Those Great, thank you, Mr. Goldberg. Stuff. Any questions? No, thank you. Uh, we'll take this into committee. Seems fairly straightforward. Nelly, you want to make a motion? I'm uh, just, you know, I think straightforward since it's the existing use and it's an outdoor patio. I. I bring the motion to approve it. No conditions. I don't see any conditions. Okay. Do I have a seconder? Mr. Wilkins, all in favor? You have your approval, sir. Thank you very much. We move on to number 13, 428 Brock Avenue. The purpose of this application is to legalize and maintain the secondary dwelling unit in the basement, the front basement walkout, and the front porch stairs that were constructed without a building permit on the existing two-story semi-detached dwelling. The committee has before it copy plan of survey, site plan, floor plans and elevations, one photograph of the subject property, a covering letter from the agent and an order to comply. We have four form letters in support from 422, 424, 426 and 433 Brock Avenue. Through you, Mr. Chair, we don't have any registered speakers for this item. Uh, we will unmute the agent at this time. Uh, hello, I, I'm Jason Fung, the architect and agent on the file, located at 675 King Street, West Toronto. Okay, thanks very much. Hold on a sec, panel. Do we need a presentation? I don't think we need a presentation. Uh, we understand the nature of the application. We've read all the materials. Is there anything you'd like to share with us before you, we go into committee? And particularly, maybe speaking to the order to comply. Uh, yeah. Uh uh, all I want to say is this is this was built in 2001, um, and it was a former former owner that built it. Uh, the the current owners basically inherited this condition and are trying to right this wrong. So, uh, the current order order comply is a um, uh, a renewal of that 2002 order to comply. Okay, so this has been in place for quite a while. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we go into committee, panel, comments, motion? Oh, you had a question, pardon me. Uh, hang on, we're back out of committee and we have a question for you. Okay, so uh, um, I understand there is um, 
um, variance uh, with regards to front uh, soft landscaping, and uh, again, uh, understanding it's you know the, the condition you've inherited. But um, is there a way, in your view, to in, in, in improve the front uh, landscaping, soft landscaping? So, yeah, this is very tricky. If we go to the cover letter, um, the property isn't much in the front. Um, it basically kisses the front step. Uh, next page, please. That's all city lands there in the front there. So if we look at that diagram, the red is the property. Uh, there isn't much to talk about in terms of soft landscaping. Um, everything between the property line to Pro Brock Avenue is city lands. So um, it's, it's very much existing. The basement walkouts where it lands is actually where the original porch would have been which would have been hard landscaping anyway. So um, this is really a technicality. Yeah, this is one of these anomalies where the property line is almost right up to the edge of the porch. So it's very difficult. I did note that the boulevard is mostly green. So that's probably a good contributor to what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and we're back in committee. Anyone wanna make a motion on this one? I, I may make a motion to uh, approve. I think uh, just due to the unique characteristics of this property and its layout that this really is technical variance and that it's entirely minor. Okay. A seconder to that motion, Mr. Reed. Motion by Mr. Wilkins, seconded by Mr. Reed to approve. All in favor? You have your approval, sir. Thank you. We move on to item number 14. This is 14 Rosemary Lane. It's an application to alter the existing two-story detached dwelling by constructing a rear two-story addition with a rear second-story balcony, a third floor dormer addition, a rear attached garage, which is below grade uh, with a deck above, a partial rear one-story addition, and an undersized hammerhead driveway in the front yard. The existing one-story uh, addition and the detached garage will be demolished. Committee has before it a copy plan of survey, site plan, floor plans and elevations, a revised site statistics from the agent, covering letter from the agent, decision, previous decision number uh, A1039 slash 20 TEY affecting the subject property, <coughs> excuse me, a T-Lab decision, uh, I'm not going to read the order number, affecting the subject property and correspondence from the agent. We also have uh, email correspondence from transportation services <coughs> and support through eight form letters from 3, 5, 11, 15, 17, 19, and 21 Rosemary Lane <coughs> and 24 Dubourne, Dubourne Avenue. Through you, Mr. Chair, we don't have any registered speakers for this item. At this time, we'll unmute the agent. Good afternoon. It's Peggy Chu, 124 Merton Street, Street 505. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we'd like a short presentation uh, in part because this has had a bit of a history behind it. Maybe you could bring us up to speed with your application. Can we also specifically address well, the transportation sure. uh, conditions? The transportation wants to refuse two variances. Transportation, uh, as you probably are aware, would like to refuse the two variances with respect to the front driveway. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to speak to that. And I believe if uh, we can pull up the uh, drawing package that was submitted for the application. Thank you. Thank you, staff. If uh, I can, uh, if we can refer to A0.1, the existing site plan. That's right. Okay, I can speak briefly to the previous application, uh, the C of A application, the TLAB application. It was for a replacement dwelling. Um, and uh, our current proposal is for a new owner uh, who uh, intends to maintain the existing dwelling with its heritage listed. We are proposing to add only to the rear and to demolish the existing standalone garage. 
So if I can, uh, if we can uh, zoom in just a bit into the front yard. So uh, in our supporting documentation package, we included some photographs of the existing driveway to the north side of the existing dwelling. It's a relatively, it's an existing condition. It's a relatively narrow driveway. It suits one car. It goes to a, currently goes to a two-car garage uh, in the rear side yard. Our proposal is to uh, demolish that garage and then to attach an, a, a garage at the rear of the uh, house as part of the addition that we're proposing, which is at 90 degrees to the existing driveway. Uh, we have no uh, means to widen this driveway. And the concern we have is that without a, a larger hammerhead turnaround in the front yard within private property, um, that if a car uh, came up the driveway from the new garage, it won't see um, if a second car is coming down the driveway. So that hammerhead turnaround allows that car coming off the, the street to basically back up and pull aside while allowing this um, the car to come up the driveway. And it's important uh, because if you if we can uh, if we can go to drawing a zero uh, a two point two rather which is the rear elevation that we're proposing we do have yeah keep going thank you uh, we do have a mudroom entrance at that northwest corner that is adjacent to the driveway so we would very much like to not have to back up or back down rather the driveway um, and that hammerhead dimension gives us the the uh, the, the clearance so that the car uh, a second car can pull out of that driveway width and uh, the first car coming out of the drive uh, coming up the driveway isn't the one that has to back up and I think this is a this is a kind of an endemic you know condition for a lot of properties that have single car driveways, and I, we we demonstrated that we've shown um, examples. Uh, we uh, wanted to make sure that this is a, a legally uh, recognized uh, hammer turnaround that will just allow the, the the family to you know use the parking and the driveway without any you know, sort of potential hazard uh, at turning the corner. Okay, and can you speak to the other elements of the application, please? You have a minute sure. and a half. Okay, all right. Um, for the other five uh, minor variances, uh, uh, the length and the, the depth uh, relate to uh, the measurement for uh, the excavated rear deck, the rear deck um, projection. Uh, that rear deck is uh, basically the roof of the proposed attached uh, garage at the basement level. The way the site slopes from uh, Rosemary Lane to the rear yard, uh, this is a great level garage. Um, so as I noted uh, in the supporting documentation, the existing garage is also below the elevation of the street uh, or the driveway at the street curb. Uh, so this is just the, the nature of the site. Um, so really the, the house proper uh, only exceeds building length and depth by about a meter, uh, which we believe is uh, very minor in nature. We don't have any uh, objections from our uh, adjacent neighbors. And that length is, uh, that length and depth variance only applies to the south side of the proposed uh, rear addition. On the north side, because of our driveway, we are well behind uh, the length and depth. Okay, thank you very much. Panel, questions? Uh, yeah. Dylan? Um, I'm just looking at the current condition, uh, the photo that you contributed, and I'm also looking at uh, Google, Google Street View. Um, there, I mean, there is a wider driveway at the base of the driveway at the moment. Uh, if, in the rare occasion where 
a car was trying to go down and encountered a car coming up, couldn't the car just pull over into that extra space that already exists? I'm not. I think you're. Are you referring to the site plan where we've shown? Well, I'm just. I'm looking at. I'm looking at the photo that you submitted of the current situation. And at the at the front of the driveway where it meets the road, the driveway widens considerably, and there's certainly space for two cars there. So if someone needed to oh. pull back and pull over, couldn't they just pull into that space? Okay, that's on Municipal Boulevard. Um, but this would just be temporary, that, right? It would be temporary to let the other car pass, so it doesn't matter if it's on the Municipal Boulevard. It, it is, but it is not as wide. Um, so the way we have... Uh, shown the hammerhead is you when you're backing up you can actually pull clear of the width here because it's at the boulevard you basically have to back up and then onto the street to pull basically away so like that that existing um sort of area is not the depth that's required to pull in and clear you would still have to maneuver basically to the road to be able to get back into that space. I, I, sorry, it it looks more than large enough for two vehicles side by side. It's it's actually on the site plan. Um, I think that's a good comparison if you can see it on our site plan A zero point one A. A zero point one. So you, you'll see how our turnaround is uh, parallel to the front lot line. Yeah. You will see that lay-by space, but you can't drive into that lay-by space basically without the, the additional space. I mean, isn't it going to be a fairly rare yeah. occurrence for a car of the same family to be going in and another one coming out at the same time? I'm, I mean, I, I can't speak to how regular that would be, but I, the, the, the proposed garage at the rear is a two-car garage. It is a, um, a family, uh, basically, with two cars, and I think in the mornings it's where uh, that could be. Uh, but they would both be going out. Arctic. Like the, the issue would be if one car is coming in and the other car is going out, that's the problem, right? That's right. I, you know, I think there are occasions, and I think that's quite common nowadays, for school drop off or, uh, you know, very different hybrid work hours. So I, I, what we, what I understand with our clients, uh, in conjunction with the landscape architect, was just to be able to give this lay by space and park like pullover space that won't encumber the driveway width, and I think. Part of that is just how how quickly you see the car coming up the driveway, as opposed to you're already coming down the driveway. Do you think, think you could add a, a mirror that would might help the that visibility, like they have in some parking garages, steel mirror? If that is yeah, I mean, if, if that is a last resort, yeah, I mean, but for sure. I mean, we we hope that's. Uh, Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any additional questions, Nelly? And just to uh, clarify, it, it, it's the nature of the um, the patio over the garage, right, that can trigger the depth and length uh, variances, from what I understand. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. On that same site plan, you will see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the 25 meter, you know, point three length. It's including the the, you know, the garage and the patio, right? That's right. Okay. The, um, uh, we've noticed that in the floor plans, you've shielded uh, the, the, the use uh, of each floor for privacy reasons. So uh, we don't know what room the second floor rear balcony is off. Can you just tell us what room that is? Sure, that is off of the primary bedroom. Okay, so uh, it, do you have privacy screening on on the sides of that? 
We are, I mean, we were certainly willing to do that. Uh, when we showed this to the neighbors, uh, they didn't have any issues because I think the site in and of itself is really well screened. Uh, we also have driveway flanking the side yards on both sides. Uh, so the, the balcony is relatively far from uh, adjacent neighbors' properties. Okay. Thank you. Panel, any further questions? Okay. We go in. There's no speakers? No. We go into committee. Your thoughts? Uh, I'll just say, Dylan, your, your line of question uh, was good when uh, I'm wholly unconvinced of the need for a hammerhead driveway. Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, I want to say overall, I think this is a really good project. Like, definitely uh, convert, getting rid of that rear garage, you know, and, and improving the existing house rather than tearing it down was the previous owner wanted to. So, I, I mean, first of all, I want to say that I'm very supportive of the project overall. Um, I think the garage is, you know, uh, actually a much better solution than the current situation. Um, but I do not see a need for the hammerhead. And I note that many of the photos that were provided of other hammerheads, people were using it for parking. Um, so my concern would be that uh, what is supposed to be a turnaround thing would actually end up being used as parking because it's more convenient than going all the way down to the garage. Um, and the car, in fact, would end up being there all, all, a lot of the time. But it's not being, it's not being asked for as a as a parking uh, spot. And I noticed in many other pictures of Hammerhead turnaround examples, there were cars parked there. Um, so uh, my, my inclination is to, accept, is to follow transportation advice and accept all the variances except variances one and two. That's, that would be my okay. instinct. Anyone else? Nelly? Yes, I'd like to echo your point about you know, Mr. Reed's points about you know the you know the first two variances. I think that I would agree with the transportation logic and you know follow the advice. The rest, it uh, you know the combined you know, the rest of the variances with regards to you know the length and the uh, overall uh, platform area, they seem uh, not minor in combined. But if we look at this particular project that being the you know the garage and the um, you know the patio above, I don't I, I don't mind that. I think it's a good you know design solution for the for the area. But number okay. first, number one and number two, we should strike. Okay. Uh, anyone have any thoughts about screening? I'm I'm inclined on upper story balconies to screen the sides, uh, notwithstanding. Um, the, the, the agent's point, I think it's, it's a good practice. Okay, uh, can I get a motion then? Nelly? I bring the motion to approve the application uh, and accept for variance number one and number two, following the transportation advice, and to add the condition of privacy screening on the second floor balcony. Yeah, I'm just looking for the which direction the, is it the north and south sides? Uh, yeah, north and south sides. North. Okay. Okay, do I have a seconder? Mr. Reed, so we have a motion to uh, approve this application. Um, uh, variances three through seven. Uh, and refuse variances one and two. Moved by Ms. Volfort, seconded by Mr. Reed. All in favor? Okay, that is approved with those. Yeah, and the condition for privacy screening. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we move on to item number 15. Uh, 114 Rainsford Ave uh, Road. This is an application to alter the existing two-story semi-detached dwelling by constructing a rear ground floor deck. Also to alter the front and rear yard landscaping area by increasing the hardscaped areas and constructing a new detached ancillary structure, a pergola in the rear yard. The committee has before it a copy of plan of survey, site plan, floor plans and elevations, an arborist report and we have comments from Urban Forestry. Three, Mr. Chair. Uh, no registered speakers for this item, and we'll unmute the agent. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
afternoon, Mr. Chair. This is Matthew Crowder-Tanzuli, address is 107 Gladstone Avenue in Hamilton, Ontario. Okay, panel, uh, do we need a presentation on this one? I wouldn't mind hearing a little bit more about the landscaping, so if you could uh, indulge us and, and give us your perspective on the variances uh, that are with respect to landscaping and your proposal to hardscape. Yes, no problem, Mr. Chair. Uh, in the front yard, we're essentially just uh, redoing the pathways that are actually existing there already. We're just widening them about six inches for each pathway. So uh, just by way of replacing them and making them a little bit larger, we do require to comply with the uh, current bylaws. So uh, all in all, it is uh, pretty much the same setup, just a little bit wider of a pathway. Um, so that would be my comments in, in regard to the front yard, uh, uh, softscape and hardscape. Uh, in the rear yard, it is just uh, uh, a fairly modest sized pergola just for something to have uh, an accented dining area. So a little bit larger than permitted for this lot pergola. I have a question. Okay, questions, Mr. Reed. Yeah, sorry, can you clarify? So I'm just looking at the site plan, uh, the proposed site plan, and there's, um, there's a walkway to the stairs, which is completely normal. Uh, and then it says new hardscape, and there's a walkway that goes to the side. Uh, so is that in fact new, or are you, is it existing hardscape you're replacing, or what, what's, what's the explanation yeah, for that? Yeah, sorry, that is, that is a bit, bit uh, misleading. Um, it is an existing pathway there, and it is that shape, and pretty much in that exact location is becoming just a, a bit wider. So um, it's replacing existing hardscape, and it is a, just a bit wider. And why, why is it a bit wider? Uh, I think uh, just based on the landscape design that came from the landscape contractor, just the um, uh, coursing of the stone and the patterns they want to use, just a little bit more of a comfortable walkway. Okay. And is that walkway used for like bringing out um, garbage bins and such? Like, is that, the, is that its purpose? Uh, yes, I believe so. Yeah, just uh, general access to the rear yard and yes, garbage bins and so on. Okay. Um, let's stay with the site plan. Let's go to the backyard. Uh, your pergola, it's covered, right? It's got a roof? Uh, no, sorry. That would just be an open air uh, pergola, just uh, like a shadow structure, basically. And what's the treatment underneath? Is it uh, grass or is it hardscape as well? Uh, that would be hardscape, yes. So I'm uh, looking at the configuration down. of your backyard and I'm a little surprised that you don't have a variance for rear yard landscaping because your hardscape uh, is almost all of your rear yard. So you don't need a, a variance for rear yard landscaping? Uh, yes, that's correct. We did do a zoning review for this project, um, even though we did sign the zoning review waiver. Uh, we did first do a zoning review. The reason we signed that waiver was because we needed to add a variance that wasn't initially captured by uh, city staff, which was the pergola size. But um, from our understanding, we do not need a variance for rear yard uh, soft landscaping. Huh. Uh, that's interesting. It, it just... You know, from our experience, it just sort of looks like it, the hardscaping more than dominates the backyard. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised at that, but if that's what the zoning examiner has indicated, I guess that's what we go by. Yes, and actually... He said he did have an examiner permits. look at it before they did the waiver, right? So, I mean, that's it's his, correct. it's, yes. it's the applicant's risk in terms of proceeding mm -hmm. without a variance, but I, I would, I would wonder whether at some point you might need a variance for that. Actually, we do have a building permit that's been issued for the uh, rear yard work already. And it's hardscaping? Uh, the what, what's the nature of your hardscaping in the rear? Um, in terms of impervious or pervious? Yeah, I just wondered whether you are you using pavers, are you using permanent permeable pavers, or uh, what? Uh, what's your treatment? I believe back there? the plan is regular pavers. Um, the landscape designer here didn't, I don't think, specify on the drawings. But uh, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we are not requesting any uh, variance for rear yard softscape 
Yeah, I, and I appreciate that, uh, which again, still um, surprises me, but okay, thank you. All right, any further questions? Nelly? Okay, so uh, since we're talking you know, about the variances with regards to the front yard uh, um, landscaping, uh, would you be open to um, install uh, the permeable pavers where your uh, hard scaping surfaces um, are? I think, that, I think the owners would like to stick with just the hard scapers that they've um, proposed, not permeable pavers. Uh, I think that's their intent. Or did they note there? Sorry, staff could zoom in. Was that permeable pavers noted? Sorry, sir. Uh, I think my colleague's asking uh, for that part of your front walkway that isn't yet constructed that you're seeking approval for. Is there any opportunity to use permeable pavers for that? Uh, well, I believe if, if town staff could just zoom in right where they've had the highlighted text there, that might say permeable. Paving, I believe. Uh, yes, yeah, so that that is uh, uh, proposes permeable pavers. Okay, so it is permeable. Okay, any further questions? Okay, thanks very much, sir. We go into committee. Thoughts? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Comments? Nelly. I would uh, suggest if we approve this application, we would put a condition on you know using permeable pavers. It's it's on the site plan, so if you're comfortable that you tie to site plan, uh, or tie it to a site plan. Was it the site plan? What did we? What did? What were we just looking at? Let me. Sorry, guys. What was the document we were just looking at where he pointed out the permeable? Was it yes. not the site plan? Yes. No, 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 the site plan I'm looking at. Can we just, uh, for a moment, just go back out of committee um, and to the agent? You just referred to uh, uh, a drawing that showed the permeable pavers in the front? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, that would be on the uh, landscape uh, drawings. And I believe, um, I'm just looking online here to see what it was named. Or this was in the Arborist report, I'm sorry. In the Arborist report, yeah. Yes, yes, that was in the uh, Arborist so, report. So uh, I'm not sure we should be tying anything to an Arborist report, quite frankly. Uh, so if you want to have that condition, Nelly, then uh, put it in. Yeah. Okay. So can you just restate your motion, please? I bring the motion to approve it with the condition of installing permeable pavers in the, in the firm of the yard. Uh, there is a forestry condition number one. Oh, right, sorry. Yes, there is a forestry condition number one as well. Sure. Yeah. Motion to approve those conditions. Mr. Reed. I'll second, but I also just wanted to express a little bit of frustration that the agent didn't seem to be on top of what the plans were in the front landscape. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, and I'm, I, I, I just reflect my, again, restate my concern about the rear yard. It I yeah. just seems uh, unusual to me. Yeah. All right, uh, seconded. All in favor? The application is approved with those conditions. Thank you. We move on to item number 16, three Rose Park Crescent. Purpose is to alter the existing two and a half story detached dwelling by constructing a rear two story addition with a rear balcony. Uh, and a rear third story addition. Committee has before it a copy of plan, survey, site plan, floor plans, and elevations, nine photographs of trees on the subject property, a cover letter from the agent, and a previous decision, A0411 slash 21TEY, affecting the subject property. There are two form letters in support from one and five Rose Park Crescent. For you, Mr. Chair, we do not have any registered speakers for this item. We will unmute the agent. 
Thank you. Um, yes, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hector Portalance. Um, I reside at 978 Plantation Road, London, Ontario. Formerly moved a few years ago. Great, just hang um, on a sec, sir. Uh, panel, do you need a presentation? I think we're okay. Uh, sir, we don't need a presentation today. The panel has read all the material before us and we understand it. Is there anything you'd like to share with us before we take it into committee? Um, I just, it's the oddity that we've been to committee once before and coming back. Uh, the project has been put on hold for various reasons for a few years. And then the redesign just kind of it, you know, we wanted the extra couple of feet from what was previously approved. Okay, panel, any questions? Okay, we're in committee. Comments, thoughts, observations, motion? Mr. Reed? Uh, or Mr. Wilkins. I was just going to say when I when I look at the overall context, uh, given the um, the currently existing variance, I think of the the FSI to 0.889, the increase to 0.92 does seem uh, quite small, and so I overall support this application. I think that it I think that it meets the four tests and is a minor variance. Okay. Anyone else? Do you want to make that a motion, sir? Sure. I'll move to uh, accept. I don't believe there's any uh, conditions. So. Okay. Motion to approve by Mr. Wilkins, seconded by Ms. Volport. All in favor? You have your approval, sir. Thank you very much. We move on to... Item number 17, 180 Springdale Boulevard. This is an application to legalize and maintain the front porch enclosure, which is currently under construction uh, without the benefit of a building permit. The committee has before it a copy plan of survey, site plan, floor plans, and elevations, nine photographs of the subject property, presentation materials from the applicant, and an order to comply. We also have support, a two signature petition and support from 178 and 182. Springdale Boulevard. Through you, Mr. Chair, we do not have any registered speakers for this item. We will unmute the agent. Good afternoon. Oh, Bob Abraham's here. Uh, I, I, I don't think we need a lot of, um, I don't think we need a presentation. <laughs> um, well, that's I'll good just... of you to, to uh, uh, come to that conclusion. Uh, just hang however, on a however, second. I, I, just, I, just, I just, just clarify one. Just hang on a second. Panel. I might just want a very brief explanation as to why this is already being started construction. Okay. Did you hear that? I think we'd like a little brief explanation with respect to the uh, uh, this project proceeding without a building permit. Sure. Just trying to activate my video here. I don't know how to. There we are. There we are. Um, yeah, the, um, the ultimate goal is to enclose the front porch to make it part of the living space. So that work has not been started. The work that has been uh, started is uh, to change the finishes uh, in anticipation of the variance and building permit being issued. So um, the, um, our client has not enclosed the porch. They've merely begun the uh, preliminary process uh, which would uh, support that eventually. Okay, any questions? No, we have no questions, sir. We're uh, going to take it into committee. Thank you very much. Panel, okay. uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts? Did you have a question? No, just a, a comment. Okay. Yeah, a comment here. Again, we are seeing the front. Uh, yards of landscaping, quite a um, dramatic, uh, like four percent versus seventy-five percent, and again, uh, it ties to the specific nature of the building, right? But you know, 
as opposed to the case we had you know, earlier, there is nothing, no green barrier, nothing there. So I was wondering if, like if yeah, we, we should uh, suggest, or we can suggest the permeable papers for this. But I'll, I'll we can do that. I, and and in the, but your opinion on that? No, thank you. I, in fact, I, I uh, just referred to my notes and I overlooked what a, a question that I had from the applicant. So I'm just gonna go out of committee if that's okay. Uh, if I can just ask a question, uh, I did know, so uh, most of your front yard is on the boulevard, I get that, and, and in looking at the images, it's, it's paved, uh, as is the uh, adjacent, or sorry, uh, the, the right of way. Um, and I, uh, my colleagues asked a little bit about the uh, front landscaping, but my question is also about drainage. And uh, I do note that your downspouts for the front discharge onto your driveway, which is sloped towards the road. And frankly, I noticed your neighbor also uh, has a uh, um, eaves trough that actually extends along the driveway and discharges onto the municipal sidewalk. Um, I, I think my question would be about water treatment um, uh, on the property. And, uh, you know, as I say, your downspout discharges onto the hardscape, not anywhere where there'd be softscape where it would be uh, absorbed. And I wonder if you could just speak to that and the, the soft landscaping sure. question. Sure. Um, there are no changes proposed to the front yard. And so the only reason that the front yard uh, was identified as an issue by the zoning examiner is because the technical definition of the front yard has changed. Before the porch is enclosed, the front yard is measured to the front face of wall, uh, you know, of the, of, the, of the, you know, the brick wall of the house. And after enclosing the porch, it's measured to the front wall of the porch. So nothing's actually being extended. However, according to the definition of how front yard is measured, the front yard appears to get smaller and the ratio has changed. The ratio of the, the, the front yard landscaping as a ratio changes. So we're not proposing to do anything in the in the front yard it's the way it is it's the way it has been since uh, before you know as long as we know and um if it appears that something's changing um it, it's actually not um so there's no change proposed to the drainage which frankly i don't know where else it could go um there's simply no no space to do anything uh in the, the way it's currently configured no, I, I understand that, but you'll uh, you appreciate the argument that you're really just discharging your roof water into the municipal uh, drainage system, which is what we're frankly trying to avoid. Yeah, um, there's no, uh, if there was, if let's say, you know, we would rip up a bunch of uh, uh, hard paving and um, impair the ability to park in the front for the sake of putting water there, uh, any engineer would say that that's a bad practice and actually maybe not recommended because it's too close to the f footings of the house. You know, you shouldn't be dumping water right next to your house where there's a basement. It should be away from the house. And uh, since there's only five feet between the house and the property line, um, that can't really happen. Hmm. Okay, I'm not sure I'm entirely satisfied with that answer, but uh, I understand your point. Uh, okay, we go, any further questions? Let's go back into committee. Thoughts? Isn't it actually like a bylaw now that you're not supposed to dump your water onto the... Again, it's part of why we have, we always want to get permeable pavers or why we have yeah. landscaping is that you are supposed to discharge your, your water solely on your own property. You're supposed yeah. to have a process to deal with it. Exactly. Um, I, I think our preference is that it deals, it discharges in a way that um, gets absorbed by uh, the property. Yeah. And it doesn't always happen. Um, but I just did notice that in this instance, um, yeah. that it was a, it was a, it was related a little bit to the lack of front yard landscaping. Absolutely. So I don't, I don't know if there's a remedy in this situation, uh, but uh, I, I did want to ask about it. Um, sorry, it's just 
I'm concerned about this lack of uh, soft landscaping uh, on the front, and everything is concrete walkway, concrete uh, dry pad, everything, and you know, goes back to the storm water and you know, rainwater. Um, I would, if we were to approve this up application, I would, you know, add the condition of the permeable, permeable, sorry, permeable pavers, but you know, there is concrete walkway, um, you know, it's hard to suggest where there is, you know, the, the Well, there, technically, there is a strip uh, of privately owned land there, which is currently asphalted. Uh, and, it, you know, it, it's not unreasonable to require that to be permeable pavers. Uh, and uh, that, in fact, would help a little address the discharge issue, in my mind. Okay. Any other thoughts? Okay, can I have a motion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that portion of the privately owned uh, area in front uh, with the exception of the planter, uh, be replaced with permeable pavers. Okay. Okay, we have a motion to approve with that condition. Do I have a seconder? Okay, Mr. Wilkins, all in favor? You have your approval with that condition, sir. Thank you. Okay, now on to... Uh, item number 18, which is uh, 290 Waverly Road. This is an application to alter the existing two-story detached dwelling by constructing a rear two-story addition, a partial third-story addition, a rear ground floor deck, a rear basement walkout with a terrace, a rear second-story balcony, new front porch, and a front second-story bay window, and also to permit a parking pad in the rear yard abutting the laneway. Panel has before it a copy of plan of survey, site plan, floor plans, and elevations. Decision number A0133 slash 21 TUI affecting the subject property. Uh, uh, Toronto local appeal body decision affecting the subject property. An arborist report, presentation materials from the agent, staff report from urban forestry, and correspondence and opposition from 288 Waverly Road. Through you, Mr. Chair, I'd like to bring to the attention of the members that um, we received a revised zoning notice uh, yesterday, late yesterday afternoon, so it's not part of your package. So I do request that the agent, as part of their presentation, explain any changes based on this revised zoning notice. Uh, we do have one registered speaker in opposition, but at this time we will unmute the agent. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Tusi. Hello, Sean, you have been unmuted. Yes, you can hear me? Yes. Hello, you can hear me? Okay, hi, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sean Tusi. I'm the office principal at Mimar Architects, Inc. The address is 2323 Youngest Street, Unit 503, Toronto, Ontario, M4P2C9, representing the owner today. Great, thank you very much. I think we'll start off, if you could take us through the revisions that you're making to the variances, please. Absolutely. There is uh, no uh, uh, revision to the public notice and what was submitted, so I'm just going to confirm that the zoning notice represent the uh, zoning waiver that we submitted. Thus, there will be no changes to what you have in front of you today. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll need a short presentation. We have someone lined up to speak in opposition. Uh, so I'll give you a uh, background, uh, Mr. Chair and the members. So this application has been in front of you. Um, I believe uh, two two years ago, actually, on 2020, uh, my staff are mentioning almost four years ago, uh, it was approved at that time, and there it was a bigger project. It was eight 
variances. At that time, it was approved by the Committee of Adjustment. The neighbor, which is also present in opposition, was attendance. Uh, they filed an appeal in TLAP, um, and you can imagine it takes quite some time to go through TLAP. Uh, it was refused um, at the TLAP, the same design that the committee approved. And now the design you have in front of you is a smaller design, smaller project um, than what was previously approved by the committee and refused by the TLAP. This new design is a smaller and it only has three variances. As you can see um, in the presentation, if we just keep the first slide, so I'll start with that. So we have two story addition at the back. Um, and then the purple area represent the existing. And then only the third floor addition is only on the third floor. So if you could go to the next sl slide, I'll explain. So the variants there are, so this basically shows um, the height. Um, the, there is no height variance. Let me repeat, there is no height variance. The three story is permitted in that area. And we're asking for a main wall height um, which from a permitted eight and a half goes to nine and a half. But as you can see in the design, the third floor is pushed back. So the third floor is pushed back. So the effect of that main wall height is even uh, is much less. And because as you can see, there is a slope. So that even reduces further. If you go to the next um, slide, um, in terms of the comparable, or is it going to set precedence, or how is the character of the neighborhood? I do understand the committee don't look at the actual numbers comparison, but I think this shows you that this does not set any precedent should the committee decide to approve the application. It is already smaller than what it was approved by the committee before, um, and also almost all the variant, all the all the comparisons that you can see here are more than this. There are even more than one. Um, we are going to 0 0.97 um, for the variances uh, related to the FSI, but the comparables are more than that. The other two variances, the main wall height, is just for that portion of a third story, which if I can ask the staff to go to the drawings and the page that shows the side view, um, the actual drawings, the one that shows, I believe, is 812. 812, the page, it, yeah, this is a good one. So as you can see, the third floor that is triggering the main wall height, again, the height is in full compliance, is not even the full building length. Um, it does not even project towards the back to the neighbor. It also does not project all the way to the front. So it's really, there is a this setback that comes in as only part of the building. And, um, and because of that, it has a much lower impact. The setbacks are only for the two story their extension of the existing. So really there are an existing variances that you will be reviewing. With that said, um, I believe if there is any questions, we think this is very reasonable. Uh, it meets the four tests. It has um, the city's um, zoning, the direction is to uh, more intensifications. And this would be a very good sample of respecting the street, respecting the neighbors in a sense that it doesn't go all the way to the back. It has set back from the street to do everything that the bylaw permits it but with having um, in mind what is happening with the neighborhoods and as well as the building. With that said, any question I would be happy to answer. Okay, Mr. Reed. I have two questions. The first one is just a clarification. So on, uh, on, on um, the site plan A.08 uh, for the third floor, at the front it says flat roof, but then on the side ones, it looks like there's a railing and it's a balcony. Can, can you clarify what that is at the front? Is that a, is that a balcony off the bathroom or is no, that? It is an art, no, it's a, it's a flat roof. It is, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to clarify, it is a flat roof. It is not a balcony. It's the, these are more of architectural features for the design. So the railings are just decorative? Yes, yeah. They're, they're like an architectural feature. They're not, yes, yeah, they're decorative. Okay, thank you. Um, the second question is, I, I mean, uh, we know that the, the original plan was rejected by T-Lab, so could you just very quickly give us, like the, the FSI is almost identical to the previous one, so you can give us very quickly like what the differences are, what you've changed that might make this more acceptable? Yeah, so there was a garage that uh, based on the zoning, for you Mr. Chair, there was a um, th th there was a building length that was reduced to comply with the bylaw. The current uh, building length you have in front of you is fully in compliance to the requirement of zoning. 
the previous one that was that went to T Lab, that one we made it shorter. Um, you might say why the, the FSI stayed the same because the third floor ended up becoming a slightly bigger, but the building then becomes shorter. And then there was a garage at the back on the previous design that now it is removed. So there is no garage anymore. And instead there is a, there is a uh, parking path. Okay, thank you. Okay, any additional questions? No, okay, we'll go to the next speaker. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we will unmute Ian Fleet. Good morning. It's uh, Flett, F L E T T. Good morning, committee, or good, good afternoon, committee members. Um, I'm representing the owners of 288 Waverly Avenue. My name is uh, Ian Flett. My address is 99 Yorkville Avenue, uh, Suite 200. Um, I also represented 288, the owners of 288, at the uh, at the T Lab in respect of their appeal. So I have some familiarity with this matter. Um, and I'd like to begin with uh, with the last question that the committee asked in terms of the differences between this application and the last. And to be very clear, the difference uh, in terms of the requested FSI is that in this in in the before in the 2021 application, the FSI was 97.89 percent for a 222.38 meter square building, and today's application is 97 percent for a 220.37 meter square building. So there's a reduction of the house by two meters squared. And the reason that my submissions to you are going to focus principally on the FSI is because it is the FSI specifically that the T-Lab found did not respect the physical character of the area around this application. That TLAP hearing uh, extended was a two-day hearing, but actually was drawn out over over a couple of years for a number of reasons. Um, but it, one of the things that's important to remember is that in this case, the TLAP officer actually invited the applicants in this case to submit further evidence in support of their case as a concerned FSI. And that further evidence established that on the block where this application is, the average FSI is 0.52 and the median FSI is 0.5. There's nothing close to the requested FSI. And when you look at where the other FSIs occur, the higher FSIs are south of Norway. Uh, and, and that's where there, there are a number of FSIs that get higher. But the reality is that on Waverly Avenue and in this section of Waverly Avenue, there are not high FSIs as was being requested by the applicant uh, and, and what's indicated, or well, even if you look at what they've suggested are comparables, but not comparables because they're not really on the street or near to, near to the application. Um, the TLAB found that the, that FSI that was being requested specifically did not meet um, OPA policy 4.1.5. And just as a matter of fairness, uh, that in this situation, of course, my clients would not have any right of appeal, but they invested a considerable sum of money in their uh, in their opposition before the TLAB, uh, hiring a professional land use planner and myself, counsel, arguing this over two days of extensive evidence, cross-examination, and all the rest to establish a, a deep dive into this question of whether this FSI is appropriate. And unfortunately, we have an applicant who's returned now with about the same thing. And I think to his credit, he's admitted that in effect, he, the, the FSI request is about the same as it was before. Um, just to cover off the other variances, uh, there's not a concern for the side yard setback variance because that's an existing condition. But the main wall height argument, um, it also doesn't is not as supportable as, uh, as the applicant might wish to believe. First, one of the references for the main wall height, it, when you cross-reference, I'm sorry, 297 Waverly Road, which is the one comparable they use in their supporting material, um, there there's an FSI of 0.72, an FSI of 0.72 on the one street, on the one address on their street where there's a comparable main wall height. Um, and the only other remark is that it, there's, there's, a, and this is something that was examined in the TLAP decision, uh, and there's no need to turn to it unless anybody wants to, but there is a distinction in building type here where you have two and three story building types, and they do form the predominant building type in the area two and three story single, single detached um, and semi detached structures. But there is a difference when you look at whether or not uh, the, uh, the, this GFA is being deployed over two and three stories. And, and the, the conclusion there is that without that kind of fine-grained detail, 
um, you're overlooking some of the fabric of of the neighborhood. Um, those are those are my comments. I think that the the decision, if you had a chance to read it, uh, it, it, it it's it's worth bearing that um, uh, the uh, the applicant had hired Goodman's, the were David Bronskill's firm, and uh, and, uh, and Max Laskin's firm to to argue for uh, the applicant in this case. Um, and they sought a review of the T-Lab decision. They asked the T-Lab to review its own decision. And even after a thorough review of its own decision on many different grounds, the T-Lab upheld that decision. Um, so just as a matter of consistency and fairness, and the fact that a, an expert tribunal has found that this FSI is not appropriate for this location, I would ask that you refuse this application. Thank you, and uh, happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Mr. Flett. Uh, panel, any questions? Okay, let's bring the agent back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so since um, that, it seems that the FSI seems the one that is the major, the main concern, um, I will focus most of my response to that. So um, the, the same way that the TLAB decided that to refuse the application, the Committee of Adjustment before that decided that it is. So I don't think because the TLAB refused the application or because the Committee of Adjustment approved the previous one, there should be any precedent set or, or they should be the base for your review and approval. This is a completely new design. It's different from what was in TLAB and it needs to be uh, reviewed in its own light, in my opinion, of what is in front of you. So the previous design has two meter extra building length, about two meter extra building length that I could understand it could have some adverse impact on the adjacent neighbor. The new design does not have that. And the the actual FSI is built in the third floor, which doesn't even touch or gets close to the neighbors under north or south. And then the comparables that we provided for the FSI, which they are much more than this. Again, they're much more than this. They are in the same zoning, even though they're not in the same neighbor, they're not in the same street. If they're not, they are in the same zoning. And we did, do our best to push back the third floor to remove any adverse effect of the third floor. And if we agree that the planning department of the city of Toronto, I don't believe the council here that talking on behalf of the owner are expert in planning. Um, but I think if we agree the planning department of city of Toronto is expert in planning matters, um, they do have no objection to this design. They also didn't have any objection into the previous design. But again, let's just keep the focus on this. The planning has no objections. The extra FSI has been achieved without violating the height. It was achieved without violating the, um, the building length. It was achieved by keeping the existing setbacks. So, and the third floor that is causing other variances is partial. It doesn't even cross the rear wall of the adjacent building. And if the zoning permits the third floor, if the zoning permits the third floor, then that means the zoning expect and permits the third floor. And as the council also mentioned, the third floors are part of the fabric and the characteristic of that neighborhood. So we're not making the building longer than one the bylaw permits, and we're putting a third floor, and the third floor is less than half and is pushed back from the front. So, Considering that all these applications, we are we are fine uh, if the committee decides to, should they decide to approve the application to tie the decision to the drawing to submit to make sure the third floor stay where it is and, and the allocation of the FSI doesn't change. We're absolutely fine with that. But we believe inside, in light of that, the urban forestry has no issue with this. Uh, planning department has no issue with this. The neighbor that is on the north that you could say could potentially get the extra any extra shadows or anything impact from it, they have no objection with it. The neighbors across the street or any other area, they do not have. And this does not by any means create any precedent in this, app, in, in, in this neighborhood overall or through the zoning. So respectfully, we believe this is something that meets the four tests and we request your approval. Thank you very much. Panel, any questions? No? Okay, let's take it into committee. Anyone want to start? Sure, I'll start. Um, <clears throat> on the one hand, I do sympathize with uh, the 
the feeling that like you can go to T Lab and have something decide and then it just comes back. Um, but this does seem like this has been an improved uh, plan um, with uh, fewer variances, which I think is important. Um, uh, and honestly, I understand the original uh, Committee of Adjustment decision, which was totally in favor of the previous one. Uh, this doesn't really seem like a particularly extraordinary um, uh, plan. Um, we've, we've, we've allowed many, many uh, additions that go to this kind of uh, FSI in the past. Um, I think anyone in Committee of Adjustment can see, has, has approved this size many times. I take the applicant's point that um, even if the comparables are a certain distance from uh, the house in question, that they are in the same zoning area, uh, which I think is significant. Um, uh, and and uh, other than the FSI, the other variances are pretty small. Um, it, it's completely normal to have be people be adding third floors to the to the um, to their houses in, in in the older parts of Toronto um, to create more space, and I, I feel like also the the decision of T Lab was based on considerations that are kind of uh, becoming less significant uh, for planning in Toronto. So that that need to keep neighborhood character, um, I think, is taking second uh, fiddle. Uh, to the need for intensification, providing more space in the city. Um, I don't think that the, that 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 neighborhood character thing should be constraining people from building uh, allowed third stories on houses. Um, uh, and uh, you know, and I don't think that it necessarily means that we should stick to one particular. Um, uh, architectural uh, style. Uh, I, I appreciate that the f third floor is set back a little bit. I think that's really important, um, and I think they've made an effort to do that. So um, I, I, f I feel like uh, under normal circumstances, this would be pretty straightforward and supportable. Um, uh, I do I do recognize the how frustrating it would be, but it has been changed, and there are fewer variances. So I feel like this is a new proposal. It's not just the same proposal coming back again. And so I, I feel it's supportable. Anyone else? Um, I suppose I'm, I'm a bit mixed on the proposal. I, I totally understand what Mr. Reed is saying. I spent a fair bit of time reading through the T-Lab decision, and uh, I, I don't by any means think it's binding or anything like that, but where it's helpful is the really detailed look at the neighborhood and, and the character, I think. And one thing I notice what's changed from here is uh, what was a, a problem for the T-Lab, it appears, is that uh, three stories weren't characteristic in that immediate neighborhood, and now three stories are permitted. but. I still think, um, I don't know, I'm not concerned about, or I'm not entirely sure if the, uh, the, the larger floor space index uh, as well as that height issue is, is uh, minor. I, I'm a bit on the fence still. I'd be okay. curious to hear what others have to say. Really? So I'm... In terms of uh, neighborhood character, respectively disagree. I think it's important, uh, but there are ways, right? So in this regard, uh, I think um, setting back the third floor does mitigate this, uh, the impact. And like, if you look at the, you know, how the neighbor immediate neighborhood looks, it's all two and a half story buildings. So, and um, there is not much variety, let's say, in terms of uh, architectural uh, form, so we have to be careful and not to, con and again, I think the character is important, uh, uh, but in, in this case, I think the wall height and uh, FSI, and FSI, yes, it's important, but it's not the only. You know, argument we, we should use, so I, I, I think it's supportable and in turn, you know, and I, I appreciate the fact that the, you know, the the design was uh, changed to to make it a bit more, you know, palatable and only three 
uh, variances. So I think it's supportable. Great, thank you. I'll, I'll just weigh in. I'm not going to. Uh, I would agree with uh, Mr. Reed, Ms. Bolport. I, I, I'm not going to repeat their arguments because I thought they were well stated. Um, uh, other than um, I, I tend to agree, focusing on emphasis. I emphasize, frankly, a measure of massing um, relative to the lot size, and that is changing as we need uh, as more and more homeowners are looking to increase density for a variety of different reasons. Um, and streets like this and neighborhoods like this are frankly in transition. So uh, it's, it's and, and taste is in the eye of the beholder. And this instance, um, I don't think it measurably will detract from the character of the community. I think the fact that the massing is set back both on the rear and the front uh, mitigates the overall impact and, and uh, on the neighbors and the neighborhood. So I, I, and the fact that this proposal has come back um, significantly changed from what was uh, previously uh, before the tribunal, I think is a, a positive. So I too will be supporting this application. I'll look to one of the members for a motion. Mr. Reed. Um, I'll make a motion to approve um, with, uh, for the reasons that I stated earlier and that my colleagues have stated, um, with forestry conditions two and three, I believe. Yes. And uh, with a condition that the, uh, it be t uh, substantially tied to plans and elevations. I think that's a good idea. Okay, a seconder. Nelly, all in favor? Those opposed? Mr. Wilkins dissents, but the application is approved. Thank you very much. I think we will break for lunch. Yes, and resume at 2.15. Okay, back at 2.15. You can turn your videos off, microphones off. Pull out all the plugs.